Hello, everybody. We are back, and we are going to crack on with Richard the Second. And then after that is comedy of errors, or possibly sleep. We'll uh, we'll make a decision at the end of Richard. Um. I think we are going to have some guests on. At the moment, I'm not sure who they're going to be or whether they're available. Um, but uh, Alice, who's uh, on site here, who's been doing the kind of production stuff here, is going to take uh, a little bit of a sleepy while we do Richard, and I'll just power through. Um, and uh, yeah, so far we have raised $27,000 for the Samaritans, which is incredible. Um and there's there's a lot lot more to go. So um, why don't we why don't we pick a different color for Richard? Let's have a ooh, that's quite that's quite nice. So a bit of that, and we'll have a bit of um. What else can we have? Ooh, that's quite nice. Okie dokie. Um, maybe turn down the red a little bit. Yeah. All right. Richard the second. Um. So, um, I am ready to go. I'm not sure if there's anyone else in the in the stage uh, Discord chat, but I will just I'll just crack on. I think we were going to have some other people coming on playing other roles, but um, yeah, okay. I'm um, I'm ready to go. I can't hear anyone else at the moment. Um, is there anyone else on the in the stage room? Okie dokie, I can't currently hear anyone. So um, let me just log out of Discord and then log back in again. Give me one second. Okie dokie. Okie dokie, people should now be able to hear me, although I still cannot hear anyone else who's on, who's in the green room. I, ah, hello, yes I can. I have been, I have been yoded into the room. Hello, welcome along. Hello. It's good to have you here, the voice, your voice it's you're hearing now. It's great to be here. <laughs> um, are you going to play uh, Bolingbroke for us? I will. Fantastic. Well, it's really good to have you here, man. Uh, I will be your foil. Haha, <laughs> excellent. Um, I don't know what this is going to be like, so I'm starting starting to flag. <laughs> um, but we can do it. We'll get through it. As Henry Bond, I hope I've spelled Bolingbroke right. <laughs> Okie dokie. It is a very difficult name to spell. <laughs> yeah. Future future king of England, Dan Olsen. Um, all right. Well, um, I think there should also be somebody uh, on hand to play John of Gaunt, uh, as well as various other roles. So let's... Let's crack on. Richard II. Here we go. Um, Act 1, Scene 1. Here comes King Richard. That's me. As well as John of Gaunt. uh, And some other nobles in attendance. And I say... Old John of Gaunt, time-honoured Lancaster, hast thou, according to thy oath and band, brought hither Henry Hereford, thy bold son, here to make good the boisterous late appeal, which then our leisure would not let us hear, against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? I have, my liege. Tell me, moreover, hast thou sounded him if he appealed the duke on ancient malice, or worthily, as a good subject should, on some known ground of treachery in him? As near as I could sift him on that argument, on some apparent danger seen in him, aimed at your highness, no inveterate malice. Then call them to our presence. Face to face, and frowning brow to brow, ourselves will hear the accuser and the accused freely speak. High stomached are they both, and full of ire, in rage deaf as the sea, hasty as fire. And in comes Bolingbroke and Sir Thomas Mowbray. Many years of happy days befall, my gracious sovereign, my most loving liege. And I'm also Mowbray, so I say, Each day still better others' happiness, until the heavens, envying earth's good hap, add an immortal title to your crown. We thank you both, yet one but flatters us, as well appeareth by the cause you come, namely to appeal each other of high treason. Cousin of Hereford, what dost thou object against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? First, heaven be the record to my speech, in the devotion of a subject's love, tendering the precious safety of my prince, and free from other misbegotten hate, come I appellant to this princely presence, 
Now, Thomas Mowbray, do I turn to thee and mark my greeting well, for what I speak my body shall make good upon this earth, or my divine soul answer it in heaven. Thou art a traitor and a miscreant, too good to be so, and too bad to live, since the more fair and crystal is the sky, the uglier seems the clouds that in it fly. Once more, to more to, the more to aggravate the note, with a foul traitor's name stuff I thy throat, and wish so pleasant my sovereign ere I move, what my tongue speaks, my right-drawn sword may prove. Let not my cold words here accuse my zeal. Tis not the trial of a woman's war. The bitter clamour of two eager tongues can arbitrate this cause betwixt us twain. The blood is hot that must be cooled for this. Yet can I not of such tame patience boast as to be hushed and naught at all to say. First the fair reverence of your highness curbs me from giving reins and spurs to my free speech, which else would post until it had returned these terms of treason doubled down his throat, setting aside his high blood's royalty and let him be no kinsman to my liege, I do defy him, and I spit at him, call him a slanderous coward and a villain, which to maintain I would allow him odds, and meet him where I tied to run afoot, into the frozen ridges of the Alps, or any other ground inhabitable wherever English man durst set his foot. Meantime, let this defend my loyalty, by all my hopes most falsely doth he lie." Pale trembling coward, there I throw my gauge, disclaiming here the kindred of the king and lay aside my high blood's royalty, which fear not reverence makes thee to accept. If guilty dread have left thee so much strength as to take up mine honor's pawn, then stoop, and that and all the rights of knighthood, else will I make good against thee arm to arm what I have spoke or thou canst worst device. I take it up, and by that sword I swear, which gently nade by knighthood on my shoulder, I'll answer thee in any fair degree, or chivalrous design of knightly trial, and when I mount, alive may I not light if I be traitor or unjustly fight. What doth our cousin lay to Mowbray's charge? It must be great that can inherit us so much as of a thought of ill in him. Look what I speak, my life shall prove it true, that Mowbray hath received eight thousand nobles in name of lending for your highness's soldiers the which he hath detained for lewd employments like a false traitor and injurious villain besides i say and will in battle prove or here or elsewhere to the furthest verge that ever was surveyed by english eye that all the treasons for these 18 years complotted and contrived in this land fetch from false mowbray their first head and spring Further, I say, and will maintain, upon his bad life to make all this good, that he did plot the Duke of Gloucester's death, suggest his soon-believing adversaries, and consequently, like a traitor coward, sluiced out his innocent soul through streams of blood, which blood, like sacrificing Abel's cries, even from the tongueless caverns of the earth, to me for justice and rough chastisement, and by the glorious worth of my descent, this arm shall do it, or this life be spent. How high a pitch his resolution soars. Thomas of Norfolk, what sayest thou to this? Oh, let my sovereign turn away his face and bid his ears a little while be deaf, till I have told this slander of his blood how God and good men hate so foul a liar. Mowbray, impartial are our eyes and ears. Were he my brother, nay, our kingdom's heir, as he is but my father's brother's son, now by my scepter's oar, I make a vow. Such neighbour nearness to our sacred blood should nothing privilege him nor partialize the unstooping firmness of my upright soul. He is our subject, Mowbray, as uh, so art thou. Free speech and fearless I to thee allow. Then, Bolingbroke, as low as to thy heart, through the false passage of thy throat, thou liest. Three parts of that receipt I had for Calais dispersed I duly to his highness soldiers. The other part reserved I by consent, for that my sovereign liege was in my debt upon remainder of a dear account, since last I went to France to fetch his queen. Now swallow down that lie. For Gloucester's death, I slew him not, but to not mine own disgrace neglected my sworn duty in that case. For you, my noble lord of Lancaster, the honourable father to my foe, once I did lay an ambush for your life, a trespass that doth vex my grieved soul. But ere I last received the sacrament, I did confess it, and exactly begged your grace's pardon, and hope I had it. This is my fault. As for the rest appealed, it issues from the rancour of a villain, a recreant and most degenerate traitor, which in myself I boldly will defend, and interchangeably hurl down my gauge upon this overweening traitor's foot, to prove myself a loyal gentleman, even in the best blood chambered in his bosom, in haste whereof, most heartily I pray, your highness to assign our trial day. Rough-kindled gentleman be ruled by me. 
Let's purge this collar without letting blood. This we prescribe, though no physician, deep malice makes too deep incision. Forget, forgive, conclude and be agreed. Our doctors say this is no time to bleed. Good uncle, let this end where it begun. We'll calm the Duke of Norfolk, you, your son. To be a make peace shall become my age. Throw down, my son, the Duke of Norfolk's gauge. And Norfolk throw down his. When, Harry, when? Obedience bids, I should not bid again. Norfolk, throw down, we bid, there is no boot. Myself I throw, dread sovereign, at thy foot. My life thou shalt command, but not my shame. The one my duty owes, but my fair name, despite of death that lives upon my grave, to dark dishonour's use thou shalt not have. I am disgraced, impeached and baffled here, pierced to the soul with slander's venomed spear, the which no balm can cure, but his heart blood which breathed this poison. Rage must be withstood. Give me his gauge. Lions make leopards tame. Yea, but not change his spots. Take but my shame, and I resign my gauge. My dear, dear lord, the purest treasure mortal times afford is spotless reputation. That away men are but gilded loam or painted clay. A jewel in a ten times barred up chest is a bold spirit in a loyal breast. Mine honour is my life. Both grow in one. Take honour from me, and my life is done. Then, dear my liege, mine honour, let me try. In that I live, and for that will I die. Cousin, throw down your gauge. Do you begin? O oh, God, defend my soul from such deep sin. Shall I seem crestfallen in my father's sight, or with pale beggar fear impeach my height before this outdared dastard? Ere my tongue shall wound my honour with such feeble wrong, or sound so base a parley, my teeth shall tear the slavish motive of recanting fear, and spit it bleeding in this high disgrace, where shame doth harbour even in Mowbray's face. We were not born to sue, but to command. Which, since we cannot do to make you friends, be ready as your lives shall answer it. At Coventry upon St. Lambert's day, there shall your swords and lances arbitrate the swelling difference of your settled hate. Since we cannot atone you, we shall see Justice Dean design the victor's chivalry. Lord Marshal, command our officers at arms, be ready to direct these home alarms. Dur, 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 dur. And so we'll leave. Uh, and here comes Gaunt and the Duchess of Gloucester. Alas, the part I had in Woodstock's blood doth more solicit me than your exclaims, to stir against the butchers of his life. But since correction lieth in those hands which made the fault that we cannot correct, put we our quarrel to the will of heaven, who, when they see the hours ripe on earth, will rain hot vengeance on offenders' heads. Finds brotherhood in thee no sharper spur? Hath a love in thy old blood no living fire? Edward's seven sons, whereof thy salt art one, were as seven vials of his sacred blood, or seven fair branches springing from one root. Some of those sevens are dried by nature's course, some of those branches by the destinies cut. But Thomas, my dear lord, my life, my Gloucester, one vial full of Edward's sacred blood, one flourishing branch of his most royal root is cracked. And all the precious liquor spilt is hacked down, and his summer leaves all faded. By envy's hand and murder's bloody axe, ah, gaunt, his blood was thine. That bed, that womb, that metal, that self-mold that fashioned thee, made him a man, and though thou lived and breathed, yet art thou slain in him. Thou dost consent in some large measure to thy father's death, in that thou thee ceased thy wretched brother die. Who was the model of thy father's life? Call it not patient, gaunt, it is despair. In suffering thus thy brother to be slaughtered, thou show'st the naked pathway to thy life, teaching stern murder how to butcher thee, that which in mean men we entitle patience. Is pale, cold coward cowardice in noble beasts? What shall I say? To safeguard thine own life? The best way is to avenge the, my Gloucester's death. God's is the quarrel for God's substitute, his deputy anointed in his sight, hath caused his death, the which, if wrongfully, let heaven revenge, for I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. Where then, alas, may I complain myself? To God, the widow's champion and defence. Why then, I will. Farewell, old Gaunt. Thou goest to Coventry there to behold our cousin Hereford and, Mel and fellow Mowbray fight. Oh, sit my husband's wrong on Hereford's spear, that it may enter butcher Mowbray's breast. 
or if misfortune missed the first career, be Mowbray's sin so heavy in his bosom that may break his foaming courser's back and throw the rider headlong in the lists. A caitiff recant, recant to my cousin Hereford. Farewell, old Gaunt. Thy sometimes brother's wife, with her companion grief, must end her life. Sister, farewell. I must to Coventry. As much good stay with thee as go with me. Yet one word more. Grief boundeth where it falls, not with empty holidays, but wait. I take my leave before I have begun, for sorrow ends not when it seemeth done. Commend me to thy brother, Edmund York. Lo, this is all. Nay, yet depart not so. Though this be all, do not quick, so quickly go. I shall remember more. Bid him, uh, uh, what? With all good speed, at Plashy visit me. Alack, and what shall good old York see there see? But empty lodgings and unfurnished walls, unpeopled offices, untrodden stones. And what here there for welcome but my groans? Therefore commend me, let him not come there, to seek out sorrow what dwells everywhere. Desolate, desolate, will I hence and die, the last leave of thee takes my weeping eye. And so they go, and then the day when Bolingbroke and Mowbray are to fight is here, and in comes the Lord Marshal and O'Merle. Okay, I guess that's me. I guess I'm also them. <laughs> uh, I am Duke of Mer uh, Merle, but I'm just waiting for Lord Marshall's line. Okay. Uh, well, given that he only has a few lines, let's bring back Sean Connery. My Lord O'Mel is Harry Hereford out. Yeah, at all points and long stand to in. The Duke of Norfolk, spritefully and bold, stays but the summons of the appellant's trumpet. Why, then, the champions are prepared, and stay for nothing but his majesty's approach. Da -da -da -da! Here comes the king, John of Gaunt, and many, many others. Um, and also Mowbray in armour and Bolingbroke ready to go. Marshal, demand of yonder champion the cause of his arrival here in arms. Ask him his name and orderly proceed to swear him in the justice of his cause. In God's name and the king, say who thou art and why thou comest thus knightly clad in arms. Against what man thou comest? And watch thy quarrel. Speak truly on thy knighthood and thine oath, as shall defend thee, heaven and thy valour. My name is Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, who hither comes engaged by my oath, which heaven defend a knight should violate, both to defend my loyalty and truth to God, my king, and his succeeding issue, against the Duke of Hereford that appeals me, and by the grace of God and this mine arm, to prove him in defending of myself a traitor to my God, my king, and me, and as I truly fight, defend me, heaven. Da -da -da -da. Marshal, ask yonder knight in arms both who he is and why he cometh hither, thus plated in habiliments of war, and formally, according to our law, depose him in the justice of his cause. What is thy name, and whenceforth come thou hither before King Richard in his royal lich? Against whom comest thou, and watch thy quarrel? Speak like a true knight, so defend thee heaven. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster and Derby am I, who ready here do stand in arms to prove by God's grace and my body's valor, enlists on Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, that he is a traitor, foul and dangerous, to God of heaven, King Richard, and to me. And as I truly fight, defend me heaven. On pain of death, no person be so bold or daring hardy as to touch the list except the marshal and such officers appointed to direct these fair designs. Lord Marshal, let me kiss my sovereign's hand and bow my knee before his majesty, for Mowbray and myself are like two men that vow a long and weary pilgrimage. Then let us take a ceremonious leave and loving farewell of our several friends. The appellant in all duty greets your highness and craves to kiss your hand and take his leave. We will descend and fold him in our arms. Cousin of Hereford, as thy cause is just, so be thy fortune in this royal fight. Farewell, my blood, which if today thou shed, lament we may, but not revenge thee dead. Oh, let no noble eye profane a tear, for me, if I be gored with Mowbray's spear, as confident as is the falcon's flight, against a bird do I with Mowbray fight, my loving lord, take my leave of you, of you, my noble cousin, Lord Amalur, not sick, although I have to do with death, but lusty young and cheerly drawing breath. Lo, as at English feast, so I regret, the daintiest lass to make the end most sweet, O thou, the earthly author of my blood, whose youthful spirit in me regenerate, doth with a twofold vigor lift me up to reach at victory above my head, 
add proof unto mine armor with thy prayers and with thy blessing steal my lance's point that it may enter mowbray's waxen coat and furbish new the name of john agaunt even in the lusty haver of his son god in thy good cause make thee prosperous be swift like lightning in the execution and let thy blows doubly redoubled fall like amazing thunder on the cask of thy adverse pernicious enemy rouse up thy youthful blood be valiant and live mine innocency and saint george to thrive however heaven or fortune cast my lot there lives or dies true to king richard's throne a loyal just and upright gentleman never did captive with a freer heart cast off his chains of bondage and embrace his golden uncontrolled enfranchisement more than my dancing soul doth celebrate this feast of battle with mine adversary most mighty liege and my companion peers take from my mouth the wish of happy years as gentle and as jocund as to jest go i to fight truth hath a quiet breast farewell my lord Securely I espy virtue with valour couched in thine eye. Order the trial, Marshal. And begin. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster and Derby, retrieve thy lance, and heaven defend thy right. Strong as a tower in hope, I cry amen. Go bear this lance to Thomas, Duke of Norfolk. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster and Derby, stands here for God, his sovereign, and himself on pain to found false and recramp, to prove the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mulberry, a traitor to his god, his king, and him, and dares him to set forward to the fight. Here standeth Thomas Mulberry, Duke of Norfolk, on pain to be found false and recreant, both to defend himself and to approve Henry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby, to God, his sovereign, and to him disloyal, courageously, and with a free desire, attending the, but the signal to begin. Shound trumpets, and ship forward combatants. Or stay, the king hath thrown his warder down. Let them lay by their helmets and their spears, and both return back to their chairs again. Withdraw with us, and let the trumpets sound, while we return these dukes what we decree. Draw near. And list what with our counsel we have done. For that our kingdom's earth should not be soiled with that dear blood which it hath fostered, and for our eyes do hate the dire aspect of civil wounds ploughed up with neighbours' swords, which so roused up with boisterous untuned drums, with harsh resounding trumpets dreadful bray, and grating shock of wrathful iron arms, might from our quiet confines fright fair peace and make us wade even in our kindred's blood. Therefore we banish you our territories. You, cousin Hereford, Upon pain of death, till twice five summers have enriched our fields, shall not regret our fair dominions, but tread the stranger paths of banishment. Your will be done, this must my comfort be. Sun that warms you here shall shine on me, and those his golden beams to you here lent shall point on me and gild my banishment. Norfolk. For thee remains a heavier doom, which I with some unwillingness pronounce. The sly, slow hours shall not determinate the dateless limit of thy dear exile. The hopeless word of never to return breathe I against thee, upon pain of life. A heavy sentence, my most sovereign liege, and all unlooked for from your highness' mouth. A dearer merit, not so deep a maim, as to be cast forth in the common air have I deserved at your highness' hands. The language I have learned these forty years, my native English, now I must forego, and now my tongue's use is to me no more than an unstringed viol or a harp, or like a cunning instrument cased up, or being open, put into his hands that knows no touch to tune the harmony. Within my mouth you have enjailed my tongue, doubly portcullised with my teeth and lips, and dull unfeeling barren ignorance has made my jailer to attend on me. I am too old to fawn upon a nurse, too far in years to be a pupil now, what is thy sentence then but speechless death, which robs my tongue from breathing native breath? It boots thee not to be compassionate after our sentence, plaining comes too late. Then thus I turn me from my country's light, to dwell in solemn shades of endless night. Return again, and take an oath with thee. Oh, hang on one second. What do we got for the oath? What's he got? What's he got? 
Oh. I knew there was oh, a reason. Oh, <laughs> Lay on our royal sword your banished hands. Swear by the duty that you owe to heaven, or part therein we banish with yourselves to keep the oath that we administer. You never shall, so help you truth and heaven, embrace each other's love in banishment, nor ever look upon each other's face, nor ever write, regret, or reconcile this lowering tempest of your home-bred hate, nor ever by advised purpose meet to plot, contrive, or complot any ill against us, our state, our subjects, or our land. I swear. And I, to keep all this. Nor folk so far as to mine enemy. By this time, had the king permitted us, one of our souls had wandered in the air, banished this frail sepulchre of our flesh, and now our flesh is banished from this land. Confess thy treasons ere thou fly this realm. Since thou hast far to go, bear not along thy clogging burden of a guilty soul. No, Bolingbrook. If ever I were traitor, my name be blotted from the book of life, and I from heaven banished as from hence. But what thou art, heaven, thou, and I do know. And all too soon I fear the king shall rue. Farewell, my liege. Now no way can I stray, save back to England. All the world's my way. And Mowbray exits, never to return. That's, that's his whole role in the play. And king Richard says, Uncle... Even in the glasses of thine eyes I see thy grieved heart. Thy sad aspect hath from the number of his banished years plucked four away. Six frozen winters spent return with welcome home from banishment. How long a time lies in one little word. Four lagging winters and four wanton springs end in a word. Such is the breath of kings. I thank my leech that in regard of me he shortens four years of my son's exile, but little vantage shall I reap thereby. For ere the six years that he hath to spend can change their moons and bring their times about my oil-dried lamp and time-bewasted light shall be extinct with age and endless night. My inch of taper will be burnt and done and blindfold death not let me see my son. Why, uncle, thou hast many years to live. But not a minute, king. That thou canst give. Shorten my days thou canst with sullen sorrow, and pluck nights from me, but not lend a morrow. Thou canst help time to furrow me with age, but stop no wrinkle in his pilgrimage. Thy word is current with him for my death, but dead thy kingdom cannot buy my breath. Thy son is banished upon good advice, where to thy tongue a party verdict gave. Why at our justice seemst thou then to lower? Things sweet to taste prove indigestion sour. You urged me as a judge, but I had rather you would have bid me argue like a father. Oh, had it been a stranger, not my child. To smooth his fault, I should have been more mild. A partial slander sought I to avoid, and in the sentence my own life destroyed. Alas, I looked when some of you would say... I was too strict to make mine own way, but you gave leave to my unwilling tongue against my will to do myself this wrong. Cousin, farewell, and uncle bid him so. Six years we banish him, and he shall go. Dur, 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 and I leave. Cousin, farewell, what presents must not know. From where you do remain, let paper show. My lord, no leave take I, for I will ride as far as land will let me by your side. Oh, to what purpose dost thou hoard thy words, that thou returns no greeting to thy friends? I have too few to take my leave of you, when the tongue's office should be prodigal to breathe the abundant dolor of the heart. Thy grief is but thy absence for a time. Joy absent, grief is present for that time. What is six winters? They are quickly gone. To men in joy, but grief makes one hour ten. Call it a travel that thou takest for pleasure. My heart will sigh when I miscall it so, which finds it an enforced pilgrimage. The sullen passage of thy weary steps, a steamer's foil wherein thou art to set the precious jewel of thy home return. Nay, rather every tedious stride I make will but remember me what a deal of world I must wander for the jewels that I love. Must I not serve along apprenticehood to foreign passages, and in the end, having my freedom, boast of nothing else but that I was a journeyman to grief? All places that the eye of heaven visits are to a wise man ports and happy havens. Teach thy necessity to reason thus. There is no virtue like necessity. Think not the king did banish thee, but thou the king. 
Woe doth the heaviest sit where it perceives it is but faintly born. Go, say I sent thee forth to purchase honour, and not the king exiled thee. Or suppose devouring pestilence hangs in our air, and thou art flying to a fresher clime. Look, what thy soul holds dear, imagine it to lie that way thou goest, not whence thou comest. Suppose the singing birds musicians, the grass whereon thou treads the present strewed, the flowers, fair ladies, and thy steps no more than a delightful measure or a dance. For gnarling sorrow hath less power to bite the man that mocks at it and sets it light. Oh, who can hold a fire in his hand by thinking on the frosty caucuses, or cloy the hungry edge of appetite by bare imagination of a feast, or wallow naked in December snow by thinking on fantastic summer's heat? Oh no, the appre apprehension of the good gives but the greater feeling to the worse. Fell sorrow's tooth doth never rankle more than when he bites, but lanceth not the sore. Come, come, my son, I'll bring thee on thy way. Had I thy youth and cause, I would not stay. Then England's ground farewell, sweet soil, adieu, my mother and my nurse that bears me yet. Where'er I wander, boast of this I can, though banished, yet a true-born Englishman. <laughs> the Book of Henry, Bolingbroke. <laughs> Okay, enter uh, the king and O'Mill and uh, Green and Badgett, who are all nobles. It's the king and his lads, they're here. We did observe, cousin O'Mill, how far brought you High Hereford on his way? I brought High Hereford, if you call him so, but to the next highway, and there I left him. And say what store of parting tears were shed? Faith, none for me, except the northeast wind which then blew bitterly against our faces, awakened the sleeping room. And so by chance did grace our hollow parting with a tear. What said our cousin when you parted with him? Farewell. And for my heart disdained that my tongue should so profane the word that taught me craft to counterfeit oppression of such grief, that words seemed buried in my sorrow's grave. Marry would the word farewell have lengthened the hours and added years to his short banishment. He should have had a volume of farewells, but since it would not, he had none of me. He is our cousin, cousin. But tis doubt, when time shall call him home from banishment, whether our kinsmen come to see his friends. Ourself and Bushy, Badgett here and Green, observed his courtship to the common people, how he did seem to dive into their hearts with humble and familiar courtesy. What reverence he did throw away on slaves, wooing poor craftsmen with the craft of smiles and patient underbearing of his fortune, as to to banish their effects with him. Off goes his bonnet to an oyster wench, a brace of draymen bid God speed him well, and had the tribute of his supple knee, with thanks, my countrymen, my loving friends, as were our England in reversion his, and he our subjects next degree in hope. Well, he is gone, and with him go these thoughts. Now, for the rebels which stand out in Ireland, expedient manage must be made, my liege, ere further leisure yield them for their means, for their advantage and your highness's loss. We will ourself in person to this war, and for our coffers with too great a court and liberal largesse are grown somewhat light, we are enforced to farm our royal realm, the revenue whereof shall furnish us for our affairs in hand. If that comes short, our substitutes at home shall have blank charters, whereto, when they shall know what men are rich, they shall subscribe them for large sums of gold, and send them after to supply our wants, for we will make for Ireland presently. Bushy, what news? Is there a bushy? Am I bushy? Am I also bushy? <laughs> Old John of Gaunt is very sick, my lord, suddenly taken, and hath sent post haste to entreat your majesty to visit him. Where lies he? At Eli House. Now put it, heaven, in his physician's mind, to help him to his grave immediately. The lining of his coffers shall make coats to deck our soldiers for these Irish wars. Come, gentlemen, let's all go visit him. Pray heaven we make haste and come too late. And Amen. Leave. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Here comes Gaunt, he's very sick, and the Duke of York. Will the king come that I may breathe my last in wholesome counsel to his unstead youth? Uh, Duke of York, as was, um, 
Vex not yourself, nor strive not with your breath, for all in vain comes counsel to his ear. Ah, oh, but they say the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. Where words are scarce, they are seldom spent in vain, for they breathe breath that truly leaves their words in pain. He that no more must say is listened more than they whom youth and ease have taught the gloss. More are men's ends marked than their lives before, the setting sun and the music at the close. As the last taste of sweets is sweetest last, writ in remembrance more than things long past, though Richard, my life's counsel, would not hear, my death's sad tale may yet undeath his ear. No, it is stopped with other flattering sounds as praises of his state than there are found lascivious meters to whose venom sound the open ear of youth doth always listen. Report of fashions in proud Italy, whose manners still our tardy apish nation limps after in base imitation. Where doth the world thrust forth a vanity, so it be new there's no respect how vile that is not quickly buzzed into his ears. That all too late comes counsel to be heard, where will, where will doth mutiny with wit's regard. Direct not him whose way himself will choose, tis breath thou lackst, and that breath wilt thou lose. Methinks I am prophet new inspired, and thus expiring do foretell of him. His rash, fierce blaze of riot cannot last, for violent fires soon burn out themselves. Small showers last long, but sudden storms are short. He tires betimes that spurs too fast betimes. With eager feeding, food doth choke the feeder. Light vanity, insatiate cormorant. Consuming means soon preys upon itself. This royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war. This happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. This blessed pot, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings, feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds as far from home, for Christian service and true chivalry, as is the sepulchre and of the world's ransom, blessed Mary's son, this land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world, is now leased out. I die pronouncing it, like to a tenement or pelting farm. England, bound in within the triumphant sea, whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune, is now bound in with shame, with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds. That England, that was wont to conquer others, hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Ah, would the scandal vanish with my life, how happy then were my ensuing death. Into the king, the queen, O'Merle, Bushy Green, Badgett Ross, and all the lads, all the lads are here. And York says, the king has come, deal mildly with his youth, for young hot courts being raged do rage the more. Is there a queen? Oh, but my also the queen. <laughs> How fair is oh, our... Sorry. Oh, no, no. Sorry. How fair is our noble uncle, Lancaster? What comfort, man? How is't with aged gaunt? Oh, how that name befits my composition. Old gaunt indeed, and gaunt in being old. Within me grief hath kept a tedious fast, and who abstains from meat that is not gaunt? For sleeping England long time have I watched, watching breeds leanness, Leanness is all gaunt. The pleasure that some fathers feed upon is my strict fast. I mean, my children's looks, and therein fasting hast thou made me gaunt. Gaunt am I for the grave, gaunt as a grave, whose hollow womb inherits naught but bones. Can sick men play so nicely with their names? No, misery makes sport to mock itself. Since thou dost seek to kill my name in me, I mock my name, great king, to flatter thee. Should dying men flatter those that live? No. No. Men living flatter those that die. Thou, now a-dying, sayest thou flatterest me. Oh, no. Thou diest. Thou, I the sicker be. I am in health, I breathe, I see thee ill. 
Now he that made me knows I see thee ill, ill in myself to see, and in thee seeing ill. Thy deathbed is no lesser than thy land, wherein thou liest in reputation sick, and thou, too careless patient as thou art, commit thy anointed body to the cure of those physicians that first wounded thee. A thousand flatterers sit within my crown, though whose compass is no bigger than thy head, and yet encaged in so small a verge. The waste is no whit lesser than thy land. Oh, had thy grandeur with the prophet's eye, seen how his son's sons should destroy his sons from forth thy reach, he would have laid thy shame, deposing thee before thou wert possessed, which art possessed now to depose thyself. Why, cousin, wert thou regent of the world? It were a shame to let this land by lease, but for thy world enjoying but this land. Is it not more than shame to shame it so? Landlord of England art thou now, not king. Thy state of law is bond slave to the law, and thou, and thou a lunatic, lean-witted fool, presuming on an ague's privilege, darest with thy frozen admonition make pale our cheek, chasing our royal blood with fury from his native residence. Now by my seat's right royal majesty, were thou not brother to great Edward's son, this tongue that runs so roundly in thy head should run thy head from thy unreverent shoulders. Oh, spare me not, my brother Edward's son, for that I was his father Edward's son. That blood already, like the pelican, has thou tapped out and drunkenly caroused. My brother Gloucester, plain well-meaning soul, whom fair befall in heaven mongst happy souls, may be a president and witness good that thou respects not spilling Edward's blood. Join with the present sickness that I have, and thy unkindness be like crooked age, to crop at once a too long withered flower. Live in thy shame, but die not shame with thee. These words hereafter thy tormentors be, convey me to my bed, then to my grave. Love there to live that love and honour half. And he gets carried off to die, presumably. And let them die that age and sullens have, for both hast thou, and both become the grave. I do beseech your majesty, impute his words to wayward sickliness and age in him. He loves you on my life, and holds you dear, as Harry Duke of Hereford were he here. Right, you say true, as Hereford's love, so his. As theirs, so mine, and all be as it is. And enter the Duke of Northumberland. My liege, Old Gaunt commends him to your majesty. What says he? Nay, nothing. All is said. His tongue is now a stringless instrument. Words, life and all. Old Lancaster hath spent. Be York the next that must be bankrupt so. Though death be poor, it ends a mortal woe. The ripest fruit first falls, and so doth he. His time is spent. Our pilgrimage must be so much for that. Now for our Irish wars. We must supplant these rough, rug-headed kerns, which live like venom where no venom else, but only they have privilege to live. And for these great affairs do ask some charge. Towards our assistance we do seize to us the plate, coin, revenues, and movables whereof our uncle Gaunt did stand possessed. How long shall I be patient? Oh, how long shall tender duty make me suffer wrong? Not Gloucester's death, nor Hereford's banishment, nor Gaunt's rebukes, nor England's private wrongs, nor the prevention of poor Bullingbroke about his marriage, nor my own disgrace, have ever made me scour my patient cheek or bend one wrinkle on my sovereign's face. I am the last of noble Edward's sons, of whom thy father, Prince of Wales, was first. In war was never lion raged more fierce, in peace was never gentle lamb more mild than was that young and princely gentleman. His face thou hast, for even so looked he accomplished with the number of thy hours. But when he frowned, it was against the French and not against his friends. His noble hand did win what he did spend, and spend not that which his triumphant father's hand had won. His hands were guilty of no kindred's blood, but bloody with the enmities of his kin. Oh, Richard, York is too far gone with grief, or else he would never compare between. Why, uncle? What's the matter? Oh, my liege, pardon me, if you please, if not I, pleased, not to be pardoned, I'm content with all. Seek you to seize and grip into your hands the royalties and rights of banished Hereford? Is not Gaunt dead, and doth not Hereford live? Was not Gaunt just, and is not Harry true? Did not the one deserve to have an heir? Is not his heir a well-deserving son? Take Hereford's rights away, and take from time his charters and his customary rights, let not tomorrow then ensue today, be not thyself. For how art thou a king but by fair sequence and succession? 
Now afore God, God forbid I say true, if you do wrongfully seize Hereford's right, call in his letters, patents that he hath, by his attorney's generals to sue his livery and deny his offered homage. You pluck a thousand dangers on your head, you lose a thousand well-disposed hearts, and prick my tender patience to those thoughts which honour and allegiance cannot think. Think what you will, we seize into our hands his plate, his goods, his money, and his lands. I'll not be by the while. My liege, farewell. What will ensue hereof there's none can tell, but by bad courses may be understood that their events can never fall out good. And so the Duke of York leaves. Go, Bushy, to the Earl of Wiltshire straight, bid him repair us to Eli House to see this business. Tomorrow next we will for Ireland, and tis time, I trow, and we create, in absence of ourself, our Uncle York, Lord Governor of England, for he has just and always loved us well. Come on, our Queen. Tomorrow must we part. Be merry, for our time of stay is short. Everybody leaves except the Duke of Northumberland and Willoughby and Ross. Well, lords, the Duke of Lancaster is dead. And living too, for now his son is Duke. Barely in title, not in revenue. Richly in both, if justice had her right. My heart is great, but it must break with silence ere it be disburdened with a liberal tongue. Nay, speak thy mind, and let him ne'er speak no more, that speaks thy words again to do thee harm. Tends that thou would speak to the Duke of Hereford. If it be so, out with it boldly, man, quick is mine ear to hear of good towards him. No good at all that I can do for him, unless you call it good to pity him, bereft and gelded of his patrimony. Now, afore God, tis shame such wrongs are born, in him, a royal prince, and many more of noble blood in this declining land. The king is not himself, but basely led by flatterers, and what they will inform merely in hint gainst any of us all, that will the king severely prosecute gainst us, our lives, our children, and our heirs. The commons hath he plied with grievous taxes, and quite lost their hearts. The nobles hath he fined for ancient quarrels, and quite lost their hearts. And daily new extractions are devised, as blanks, benevolences, and I wot not what, and I wot not what, but what, a God's name, doth become of this? Wars have not wasted it, for ward he hath not, but basely yielded upon compromise that which his noble ancestors achieved with blows. More hath he spent in peace, in peace than they in wars. The Earl of Wiltshire hath the realm in farm. The king's grown bankrupt like a broken man. Reproach and dissolution hang of over him. He hath not the money for these Irish wars, his burden as taxations notwithstanding, but by the robbing of the banished duke. His noble kinsman, most degenerate king. But lords, we hear this fearful tempest sing, yet see no shelter to avoid the storm. We see the wind sit sore upon our sails, and yet we strike not, but securely perish. We see the very wreck that we must suffer, and unavoided is the danger now, for suffering so the causes of our wreck. Not so. Even through the hollow eyes of death I spy life peering, but dare not see. How near the tidings of our comfort is. Nay, let us share thy thoughts as thou dost ours. Be confident to speak, Northumberland. We three are but thyself, and speaking so, thy words are but as thoughts, therefore be bold. Then thus I have from Port Le Blanc, a bay in Brittany received intelligence that Harry, Duke of Hereford, Reynold Lord Cobham, that late broke from the Duke of Exeter, his brother, Archbishop, late of Canterbury, Sir Thomas Erpingham, Sir John Ramston, Sir John Norbury, Sir Robert Waterton, and Francis Coynt, all these well furnished by the Duke of Bretagne. With eight tall ships, three thousand men of war are making hither with all due expedience and shortly mean to touch our northern shore. Perhaps they had hear this, but that they stay, the first departing of the king for Ireland. If then we shall shake off our slavish yoke, imp out our drooping country's broken wing, redeem from broken pawn the blemished crown, wipe off the dust that hides our scepter's guilt, and make high majesty look like itself, away with me and post to Ravenspur. But if you faint, as fearing to do so, stay and be secret, and myself will go. To horse, to horse, urge doubts to them that fear. Hold out my horse, and I will first be there. And then off they go to plan a rebellion. Um, in the meantime, here comes the Queen, and uh, two of the lads, Bushy and Baggett. And uh, Bushy, who is me, 
<laughs> says, Madam, your majesty is too much sad. You promised when you parted with the king to lay aside life-harming heaviness and entertain a cheerful disposition. To please the king, I did. To please myself, I cannot do it. Yet I know no cause. Why should I welcome such a guest as grief, save bidding farewell to so sweet a guest as my sweet Richard? Yet again, methinks some unborn sorrow ripe in fortune's womb is coming towards me, and my inward soul with nothing trembles at something it grieves more than with parting from my lord the king. Each substance of a grief hath twenty shadows, which shows like grief itself, but is not so. For sorrow's eye, glazed with blinding tears, divides one thing entire to many objects, like perspectives, which rightly gazed upon show nothing but confusion. Eyed awry distinguish form. So your sweet majesty, looking awry upon your lord's departure, find shapes of grief more than himself to wail, which, looked on as it is, is naught but shadows of what is not. Then, thrice gracious queen, more than your lord's departure weep not. More's not seen, nor if it be, tis with false sorrow's eye, which for things true weeps things imaginary. It may be so, but yet my inward soul persuades me it is otherwise. However it may be, I cannot but be sad, so heavy sad, as though on thinking, on no thought I think, makes me with heavy nothing faint and shrink. Tis nothing but conceit, my gracious lady. Tis nothing less. Conceit is still derived from some forefather grief. Mine is not so, for nothing had begot my something grief, or something hath the nothing that I grieve. Tis in reversion that I do possess, but what it is, that is not yet known. What I cannot name, tis nameless woe I wot. Enter Queen. God, save your majesty, and well met, gentlemen. I hope the king is not yet shipped for Ireland. Why hopest thou so? Tis better hope he is, for his designs crave haste, his haste good hope, and then wherefore dost thou hope he's not shipped? That he, our hope, may have retired his power, and driven into despair an enemy's hope, who strong we hath set footing in this land. The banished boiling broak repeals himself, and with uplifted arms is safe arrived at Ravensburg. Now God in heaven forbid. Ah, madam, tis too true, and that is worse. The Lord numbered on his son, Henry Percy, the Lords Ross, Beaumont, and Willoughby, all with all their powerful friends, are fled to him. Oh, it's me. Why have you not proclaimed Northumberland and the rest of the revolted faction traitors? We have. Whereupon the Earl of Worcester hath broke his staff, resigned his stewardship, and all the household servants fled with him to Boilingbroke. So, Green, thou art the midwife to my woe, and Boilingbroke my sorrow dismal heir. Now hath my soul brought forth her prodigy, and I, a gasping new-delivered mother, have woe to woe, sorrow to join, or sorrow to sorrow join. Despair not, madam. Who shall hinder me? I will despair and be at enemy thee. With, con with cousining hope, he is a flatterer, a parasite, a keeper back of death, who gently would dissolve the bands of life with false hope lingers in extremity. Here comes the Duke of York. Oh, sorry, and then the Queen says Here. the line. <laughs> Here comes the Duke of York. <laughs> with signs of war about his aged neck, oh, full careful business are his looks. Uncle, for God's sake, speak comfortable words. Comfort's in heaven, and we are on the earth, where nothing lives but crosses care and grief your husband he is gone to save far off whilst others come to make him lose at home here am i left to underprop his land who weak with age cannot support myself now comes the sick hour that his surfeit made now shall he try his friends that flattered him my lord your son was gone before i came he was why so go all which way it will the nobles they are fled the commons they are called and will i fear revolt on hereford's side Sirrah, get thee to Plashy, to my sister Gloucester. Bid her send me presently a thousand pound. Hold. Take my ring. My lord, I had forgot to tell your lordship. Today, as I came by, I called there. But I shall grieve you to report the rest. What is't, knave? An hour before I came, the duchess died. Heaven for his mercy. What a tide of woes come rushing on this woeful land at once. I know not what to do, I, I would to heaven. So my untruth had not provoked him to it, the king had cut off my head with my brothers. What art their post dispatched for Ireland? How shall we do for money for these wars? Come, sister, cousin, I, I, I would say, pr pray, pardon me. C go, fellow, get thee home, provide some carts, and bring away the armour that is there. 
gentlemen, will you muster men? If I know how or which way to order these affairs, thus disorderly thrust into my hands, never believe me. Both are my kinsmen, the one's my sovereign, whom both my oath and duty bids defend, the other again is my kinsman, whom the king hath wronged, whom conscience and my kindred bids to right. Well, somewhat must we do. Come, cousin, I'll dispose of you. Gentlemen, go muster up your men, and meet me presently at Berkeley Castle. I should to plashy too, but time will not permit. All is uneven, and everything is left at six and seven. And then they all leave, and Bushy says, The wind sits fair for news to go to Ireland, but none returns. For us to levy power proportionable to the enemy is all impossible. Besides, our nearness to the king in love is near the hate of those love not the king. And that's the wavering comments, for their love lies in their purses, and whoso empties them by so much fills their hearts with deadly hates. Wherein the king stands generally condemned. Judgment lie in them, then so do we, because we ever have been near the king. Well, I will, for refuge, straight to Bristol Castle. The Earl of Wiltshire is already there. Thither will I with you, for little office will the hateful commons perform for us, except like curs to tear us all to pieces. Will you go along with us? No, I will go to Ireland to his majesty. Farewell. If hearts presages be not vain, we three here art thou ne'er shall meet again. That's as York thrives to beat back Bolingbroke. Alas, poor duke. The task he undertakes is numbering sands and drinking oceans dry. Where one on his side fights, thousands will fly. Farewell, Farewell at once. once. For once, for all, and for ever. Well, we may meet again. I fear me, never. And so they leave. And here comes the bad guys. It's the, it's the Duke of Hereford, Bolingbroke. He's back. And the, and the Earl of Northumberland. With forces. With forces. How far is it, my lord, to Berkeley now? Believe me, noble lord, I am stranger here in Gloucestershire. These high, wild hills and rough, uneven ways draws out our miles and makes them wearisome. And yet your fair discourse hath been as sugar, making the hard way sweet and delectable. But I bethink me what a weary way from Ravensburg to Cotswold will be found in Ross and Willoughby, wanting your company, which... I protest, hath very much beguiled the tediousness and process of my travel. But theirs is sweetened with the hope to have the present benefit which I possess. And hope to joy is little less in joy than hope enjoyed. By this the weary lords shall make their way seem short as mine hath done by sight of what I have, your noble company. Of much less value is my company than your good words. But who comes here? It is my son, young Harry Percy, sent from my brother Worcester, uh, whensoever. Harry, how fares your uncle? I had thought my lord to have learned his health of you. Why? Is he not with the queen? No, my good lord, he hath forsook the court, broken his staff of office, and dispersed the household of the king. What was his reason? He was so not resolved when we last spake together. Because your lordship was proclaimed traitor. But he, my lord, has gone to Ravensburg to offer service to the Duke of Hereford and sent me over by Berkeley to discover what power the Duke of York, York had levied there, then with direction to repair to Ravensburg. Have you forgot the Duke of Hereford, boy? No, my good lord, for that is not forget which ne'er I did remember to my knowledge and never in my life did look on him. Then learn to know him now. This is the Duke. Oh, uh, my gracious lord, uh, I, I tender you my service, such as it is, being tender, raw and young. Which elder days shall ripen and confirm to more approved service and desert. I thank thee, gentle Percy, and to be sure I count myself in nothing else so happy as in a soul remembering my good friends. And as my fortune ripens with thy love, it shall be still thy true love's recompense. My heart, this covenant makes, my hand thus seals. How far is it to Berkeley? And what uh, keeps good old York there with his men of war? Uh, there stands the castle by yon tuft of trees, manned with 300 men, as I've heard, uh, and in it are the lords of York, Berkeley, and Seymour, none else of name and noble estimate. Uh, and here come Ross and Willoughby, one of whom is me, both of whom is me. Here come two more me's. <laughs> here come the lords of Ross and Willoughby, bloody with spurring, fiery red with haste. Welcome, my lords. I watch your love pursues a banished traitor, all my treasury 
is yet but unfelt thanks, which more enriched shall be your love and labor's recompense. Your presence makes us rich, most noble lord, and far surmounts our labor to attain it. Evermore thanks, the exchequer of the poor, which till my infant fortune comes to years, stands for my bounty. But who comes here? It is my lord of Berkeley, as I guess. Also me. <laughs> my lord of Hereford, my message is to you. It's like NPCs. My message is to you. <laughs> my lord, my answer is to Lancaster, and I am come to seek that name in England. And I must find that title in your tongue before I make reply to aught you say. Mistake me not, my lord, tis not my meaning to raise one title of your honour out. To you, my lord, I come, what lord you will, from the most glorious of this land, the Duke of York, to know what pricks you on to take advantage of the absent time and fright our native peace with self-born arms. And here comes the Duke of York. I shall not need transport my words by you. Here comes his grace in person. My noble uncle... Hi, <laughs> show me thy humble heart, and not thy knee, whose duty is deceivable and false. My gracious uncle! Tut tut grace me no grace, nor uncle me no uncle, I am no traitor's uncle, and that word grace in an ungracious mouth is but profane. Why have these banished and forbidden legs dared once to touch a dust of England's ground? But then more why, why have thou dared to march so many miles upon her peaceful bosom, frighting her pale-faced villagers with war and ostentation of despised arms? Comest thou because the anointed king is hence? Why, foolish boy, the king is left behind, and in my loyal bosom lies his power, were I but now the lord of such hot youth as when brave Gaunt, thy father and myself, rescued the black prince, that young Mars of men, from forth the ranks of many thousand French, or then how quickly should this arm of mine, now prisoner to the palsy, chastise thee and minister correction to thy fault? My gracious uncle, let me know my fault. On what condition stands it and wherein? Even in condition of the worst degree, in gross rebellion and detested treason, thou art a banished man, and here art come before the expiration of thy time in braving arms against thy sovereign. As I was banished, I was banished Hereford, but as I come, I come for Lancaster. And noble uncle, I beseech your grace, look on my wrongs with an indifferent eye. You are my father, for me thinks in you I see old Gaunt alive. Oh then, my father, will you permit that I shall stand condemned, a wandering vagabond? My rights and royalties plucked from my arms perforce and given away to upstart unthrifts? Wherefore was I born? In that my cousin, king be king of England, I must be granted I am Duke of Lancaster. You have a son, Amerler, my noble cousin. Had you first died and he been thus trod down, he should have found his uncle Gaunt a father to rouse his wrongs and chase them to the bay. I am denied to sue my livery here, and yet my letter's parents gave me leave. My father's goods are all disdained and sold, and these and all are a misemployed. What would you have me do? I am a subject, and I challenge law. Attorneys are denied me, and therefore personally I lay my claim to my inheritance of free descent. The noble duke hath been too much abused. It stands your grace upon to do him right. Base men by his endowments are made great. My lords of England, let me tell you this. I have had feeling of my cousin's wrongs, and laboured all I could to do him right. But in this kind to come, in braving arms, be his own carver and cut out his way to find out right with wrongs, it may not be. And you that do abet him in this kind, cherish rebellion and are rebels all. The noble duke hath sworn his coming is but for his own, and for the right of that we all have strongly sworn to give him aid, and let him ne'er say the joy that breaks that oath. Well, well, I see the issue of these arms. I cannot mend it, I must needs confess, because my power is weak and all ill left. But if I could, by him that gave me life, I would attach you all and make you stoop unto the sovereign mercy of the king. But since I cannot, be it known to you, I do remain as neuter, so fare you well, unless you please to enter in the castle and there repose you for the night. An offer, uncle, that we will accept, but we must win your grace to go with us to Bristol Castle, which they say is held by Bushy, Bagot, and their accomplices, the caterpillars of the Commonwealth, which I have sworn to weed and pluck away. It may be with I go with you, but yet I'll pause, for I am loath to break our country's laws. No friends nor foes to me welcome you are. Things past redress are now with me past care. And then they all leave. Um, let me just have a look at where's a good place to have an 
intermission. Oh yeah, why don't we get to the end of Act Three, Scene One, and then uh, then we'll have the intermission. So two more scenes. So enter Lord Salisbury, who is also me, and a Welsh captain who can be anyone. Yep. And cool. Can you do a Welsh accent? <laughs> Oh no! Don't, don't worry that, about it. But, <laughs> <don't> worry. <laughs> wouldn't even attempt it. My lord of Salisbury, we have stayed ten days and hardly kept our countrymen together, and yet we hear no tidings from the king. Therefore, we will disperse ourselves. Farewell. Oh, stay yet another day, thou trusty Welshman. The king reposeth all his confidence in thee. Tis thou the king is dead. We will not stay. The bay trees in our country and are withered, and meteors fright for the fixed stars of heaven. The pale-faced moon looks bloody on the earth, and lean-looked prophets whisper fearful change. Rich men look sad, and ruffians dance and leap. The one in fear to lose what they enjoy, the others to enjoy by rage and war. These signs forerun the death of the fall of kings. Farewell. Our countrymen are gone and fled, and well-assured Richard that their king is dead. Oh, Richard... With eyes of heavy mind I see thy glory like a shooting star fall to the base earth from the firmament. Thy sun sets weeping in the lowly west, witnessing storms to come, woe and unrest. Thy friends are fled to wait upon thy foes, and crossly to thy good all fortune goes. I don't know why, but for some reason whenever Shakespeare writes Welshmen, they're always really superstitious. <laughs> they're always like, ooh, like Merlin and meteors, ooh. And I think in Henry the Fourth, Part One, they cut the, there's another Welshman who's like, "Ooh, you can't!" It's like I'm a Leo, I can't do it. Um, anyway, here comes Bolingbroke, the Duke of York, all the lads, all the rebel lads, and they've taken Bushy and Green and the and the Richards lads. They've taken Richards lads prisoner, and here they come. Bring forth these men, Bushy and Green. I will not vex your souls, since presently your souls must part your bodies with too much urging your pernicious lives. For twere no charity. Yet to wash your blood from off my hands, here, in the view of men, I will unfold some causes for your deaths. You have misled a prince, a royal king, a happy gentleman in blood and liniments, by you, unhappied and disfigured clean. You have in manner, with your sinful hours, made a divorce betwixt his queen and him, broke the possession of a royal bed, and stained the beauty of a fair queen's cheeks with tears drawn from her eyes by your foul wrongs. Myself, a prince by fortune of my birth, near to the king in blood and near in love, till you did make him misinterpret me, have stooped my neck under your injuries, and sighed my English breath in foreign clouds, eating the bitter bread of banishment. Whilst you have fed upon my signories, disparked my parks, and filled my forest woods from mine own windows, torn my household coat, raised out my imprease, leaving me no sign save men's opinions and my living blood to show the world I am a gentleman. This, and much, much more than twice all this, condemn you to death. See them delivered over to execution and the hand of death. More welcome is the stroke of death to me than Bolingbroke to England. Oh my my comfort is that heaven will take our souls and plague injustice with the pains of hell. My lord Northumberland, see them dispatched. <laughs> Uncle, you say the queen is at your house. For God's sake, fairly let her be entreated. Tell her I send to her my kind commends. Take special care, my greeting be delivered. A gentleman of mine I have dispatched with letters of your love to her at large. Thank, gentle uncle. Come, lords, away, to fight with Glendower and his accomplices, a while to work, and after, holiday. Ah, so the rebels are making their move. Okay, why don't we take uh, five minutes? I'm going to have myself a cup of tea. And then we'll be. We are so close to $30,000. For the so Samarans, close. that's amazing. Oh, my word. Um, so let's take a five-minute uh, intermission as we... A- F's in the chat for Bushy. <laughs> Bushy and Green. <laughs> We've had their heads cut off. And we'll be back in five minutes uh, with, uh, with the rest of the rebellion.
And we are back with Richard II. We are into Act 3, Scene 2. And here comes here comes Richard and the lads. Uh, all the lads that are left, anyway, because <laughs> cause some of them just got their heads cut off. Um, but anyway, here they come. And King Richard says, Barclockley Castle, call you this at hand? Yeah, my lord. How brooks your grace the air, after your late tossing on the breaking seas? Needs must I like it well, I weep for joy to stand upon my kingdom once again. Dear earth, I do salute thee with my hand. The rebels wound thee, wound thee with their horses' hooves, as a long-parted mother with her child plays fondly with her tears and smiles in meeting. So weeping, smiling, greet I thee, my earth, and do I thee favour with my royal hands. Freed not thy sovereign's foe, my gentle earth nor with thy sweets comfort his ravenous sense, but let thy spiders that suck up thy venom and heavy-gated toads lie in their way, doing annoyance to this treacherous feet with which usurping steps do trample thee, yield stinging nettles to mine enemies. And when they from thy bosom pluck a flower, guard it, I prithee, with a lurking adder, whose double tongue may with a mortal touch throw death upon thy sovereign's enemies. Mock not my senseless conjuration, lords, this earth shall have a feeling, and these stones prove armed soldiers ere her native king shall falter under foul rebellion's arms. Who's Carlyle? Am I Carlyle? I can be Carlyle. Wait, I've got a list here. Here we go. No, I'm also Carlyle. <laughs> You're Carlyle. <laughs> Alice wrote it all down. Um, Fear not, my lord, that power that made you king hath power to keep you king in spite of all. I'm not O'Mill though. Someone else is O'Mill. Oh, sorry. It's it's got more text on my version, so I didn't oh, know no you were explaining. No. He means, my lord, that we are too remiss. Whilst Bolingbroke, through our security, grows strong and great in substance and in power. Discomfortable cousin, knowest thou not that when the searching eye of heaven is hid behind the globe that lights the lower world? Then thieves and robbers range abroad, unseen, and murders and did outrage bloody here. But when from under this terrestrial ball he fires the proud tops of the eastern pines, and darts his lightning through every guilty hole, then murders, treasons, and detested sins, the cloak of night being plucked from off their backs, stand bare and naked, trembling at themselves? So when this thief, this traitor of Bolingbroke, who all this while hath revelled in the night, shall see us rising in our throne, the east, his treasons will sit blushing in his face, not able to endure the sight of day, but self-affrighted, tremble at his sin. Not all the water in the rough, rude sea can wash the balm from an anointed king. The breath of worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. For every man that Bolingbroke hath pressed to lift shrewd steel against our golden crown, heaven for his Richard hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. Then if angels fight, weak men must fall, for heaven still guards the right. And I enter the, uh, the Earl of Salisbury, and I say, Welcome, my lord. How far off lies your power? Uh, nor near nor farther off, my gracious lord, than this weak arm. Discomfort guides my tongue and bids me speak of nothing but despair. One day too late, I fear my noble lord hath clouded all thy happy days on earth. Oh, call back yesterday, bid time return, and thou shalt have twelve thousand fighting men. Today, today, unhappy day too late o'erthrows thy joys, friends, fortunes, and thy state. For all the Welshmen, hearing thou wert dead, are gone to Bolingbroke, dispersed and fled. Comfort, my liege. Why looks your grace so pale? But now the blood of twenty thousand men did triumph in my face, and they are fled. Until so much blood thither come again, have I not reason to look pale and dead? All souls that will be safe fly from my side, for time hath set a blot upon my pride. Comfort, my liege. Remember who you are. I had forgot myself. Am I not king? Awake, thou sluggard majesty, thou sleepst. Is not the king's name forty thousand names? Arm, arm, my name, a puny subject strikes at thy great glory. Look not to the ground, ye favourites of a king. Are we not high? High be our thoughts. I know my uncle York hath power enough to serve our turn. But who comes here? More health and happiness betide my liege than my care tune tongue deliver him. Mine ear is open and my heart prepared. 
The worst is worldly loss thou canst unfold. Say, is my kingdom lost? Why, twas my care, and what loss is it to be rid of care? Strives Bolingbroke to be as great as we, greater he shall not be. If he serve God, we'll serve him too, and be his fellow so. Revolt our subjects, that we cannot mend. They break their faith to God as well as us. Cry woe, destruction, ruin, loss, decay. The worst is death, and death will have his day. Glad am I that your highness is so armed to bear the tidings of calamity, like an unseasonably stormy day, which makes the silver rivers drown their shores as if the world were all dissolved to tears. So high above his limits swells the rage of Bolingbroke, covering your fearful land with hard bright steel and hearts harder than steel. White beards have armed their thin and hairless scalps against thy majesty. Boys, with women's voices, strive to speak big and clap their female joints in stiff, unwieldy arms against thy crown. The very beadsmen learn to bend their bows of double fatal you against thy state. Yea, distaff women manage rusty bills against thy seat, both young and old rebel. And all goes worse than I have the power to tell. Too well, too well thou tellst the tale so ill. Where is the Earl of Wiltshire? Where is Bagot? What is become of Bushy? Where is Green that they have let the dangerous enemy measure our confines with such peaceful steps? If we prevail, their heads shall pay for it. I warrant they've made peace with Bolingbroke. Uh, the peace they have made with him indeed, my lord. Oh, villains! Vipers, damned without redemption, dogs easily won to fawn on any man, snakes in my heart blood warmed that sting my heart, three Judases, each one thrice worse than Judas, would they make peace? Terrible hell make war upon their spotted souls for this offence. Sweet love, I see changing his property turns to the sourest and most deadly hate. Again, uncurse their souls, their peace is made with heads and not with hands. Those whom you curse have felt the worst of death's destroying wound, and lie for low, graved in the hollow ground. Is Bushy, Green, and the Earl of Wiltshire dead? Aye, all of them at Bristol lost their heads. Where is the Duke, my father, with his power? No matter where. Of comfort no man speak. Let's talk of graves, of worms and epitaphs. Make dust our paper and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors and talk of wills, and yet not so. For what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lands, our lives, and all our Bolingbrooks. And nothing can we call our own but death, and that small model of the barren earth which serves as paste and cover to our bones. For heaven's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court, and there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh with its walls about our life were brass impregnable, and humoured thus comes at the last and with a little pin pours through his castle walls and farewell, king. Cover your heads and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form and ceremonious duty. For you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you. Feel want, taste grief, need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me I am a king? And I'm also Carlyle. <laughs> My lord, wise men ne'er wail their present woes, but presently prevent the ways to wail, to fear the foe, since fear oppresses strength, gives in your weakness strength unto your foe. And so your follies fight against yourself. Fear and be slain. No worse can come to fight, and fight and die is death destroying death, where fearing dying pays death servile breath. My father had the power. Inquire of him, and learn to make a body of a limb. Thou chidst me well. Proud Bolingbroke, I come to change blows with thee for our day of doom. This ague fit of fear is overblown, an easy task it is to win our own. Say, Scroop, where lies our uncle with his power? Speak sweetly, man, although thy looks be sour. 
Men judge by the complexion of the sky, the state and inclination of the day. So may you by my dull and heavy eye, my tongue hath but a heavier tale to say. I play the torturer, by small and small, to lengthen out the worst that must be spoken. Your uncle York is joined with Bolingbroke, and all your northern castles yielded up, and all your southern gentlemen in arms upon his party. Thou hast said enough. Beshrew thee, cousin, which didst lead me forth of that sweet way I was in to despair. What say you now? What comfort have we now? By heaven, I'll hate him everlastingly that bids me be of comfort any more. Go to Flint Castle, there I'll pine away. A king woe's slave shall kingly woe obey. The power I have discharged, and let him go. To hear the land that hath some hope to grow, for I have none. Let no man speak again to aught of this, for counsel is but vain. My liege, one word. He does me double wrong, that wounds me with the flatteries of his tongue. Discharge my followers, let them hence away. From Richard's night to Bolingbroke's fair day. And speaking of fair days, I need to update the goal, because we have just raised... Over 30,000 of your finest American dollars. Uh, Get in. Go on, uh, lads. 3039144 is where we'll take it. So, uh, 3039144. What should we make the next one? Let's make it... um, Chad is clamoring for uh, 42,000. Oh, of course, of course. The of course. meme number. <laughs> the meme number. <laughs> nice. Aha, yes. <laughs> yes. Expected. Um, what should we call it? Uh, just the meme number. <laughs> no. The one side number. Verily, the meme number. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I didn't type it right. Like, earlier on, I accidentally typed uh, like uh, 150,000 when I meant 50,000 for a while. It was like 10 times what I meant it to be. Okay. Oh my God, the sun's coming up. All right. Speaking of the sun rising, the sun is rising on Bolingbroke and his efforts to overthrow the land. So enter with drum and colors. Bolingbroke, the Duke of York, Northumberland and their attendants. So that by this intelligence we learn the Welshmen are dispersed and Salisbury has gone to meet the king who lately landed with some few private friends upon this coast. The news is very fair and good, my lord. Richard, not far from hence, hath hid his head. It would beseem the Lord Northumberland to say, King Richard, alack the heavy day when such a sacred king should hide his head. Your grace mistakes, only to be brief. Left I his title out. The time hath been, would you have been so brief with him, he would have been so brief with you to shorten you for taking so the head, your whole head's length. Mistake not, uncle, further than you should. Take not, good cousin, further than you should, lest you mistake the heavens or o'er your head. I know it, uncle, and oppose not myself against their will, but who comes here? Welcome, (laughs) Harry. What will not this castle yield? The castle (laughs) royally is manned, my lord, against thy entrance. Royally? Why, it contains no king. Yes, my good lord, it doth contain a king. King Richard lies within the limits of yond lime and stone, and within him, the lord, and with him, <laughs> the lord O'Merle, lord Salisbury, Sir Stephen Scroop, besides a clergyman of holy reverence who I cannot learn. Oh, be like it is the bishop of Carlisle. Noble lords, go to the rude, the rude ribs of that ancient castle. Through brazen trumpets send the breath of parley into his ruined ears, and thus deliver. Henry Bolingbroke, on both his knees, doth kiss King Richard's hand and send allegiance and true faith of heart to his most royal person, hither come even at his feet to lay my arms and power, provided that my banishment repealed and lands restored again be freely granted. If not, I'll use the advantage of my power and lay the summer's dust with showers of blood rained from the wounds of slaughtered Englishmen, to which, how far off from the mind of Bolingbroke it is, such crimson tempests should bedrench the fresh green lap of fair King Richard's land. My stooping duty tenderly shall show. Go, signify as much, where we here march, where here we march upon the grassy carpet of this plain. Let's march without the noise of threatening drum, that from this castle's tattered battlements our fair appointments may well be pursued. Methinks King Richard and myself should meet with no less terror than the elements of fire and water when their thundering shock at meeting tears the cloudy cheeks of heaven. Be he the fire, 
all be the yielding water. The rage be his, whilst on earth I reign. My water's on the earth and not on him. March on and mark King Richard how he looks. See, see, King Richard doth himself appear, as doth the blushing discontented sun from out the fiery portal of the east when he perceives the envious clouds are bent to dim his glory and stain the track of his bright passage to the Occident. Yet looks he like a king. Behold his eye as bright as is the eagle's lightens forth controlling majesty. Alack, alack for woe that any harm should stay in so fair a show. We are amazed, and thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee, because we thought ourself thy lawful king, and if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not, show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship, for well we know no hand of blood and bone can grip the sacred handle of our sceptre, unless he do profane, steal, or usurp. And though you think that all, as you have done, have torn their souls by turning them from us, and we are barren and bereft of friends, yet no, my master, God omnipotent, is mustering in his clouds on our behalf armies of pestilence, and they shall strike your children yet unborn and unbegot that lift your vassal hands against my head and threat the glory of my precious crown. Tell Bolingbroke, for yond methinks he is, that every stride he makes upon my land is dangerous treason. He is come to ope the purple testament of bleeding war, but ere the crown he looks for live in peace, ten thousand bloody crowns of mother's son shall ill become the flower of England's face. Change the complexion of her maid pale peace to scarlet indignation and bedew her pastor's grass with faithful English blood. The king of heaven forbid our lord the king should so with civil and uncivil arms be rushed upon. Thy thrice noble cousin, Harry Bolingbroke, doth humbly kiss thy hand, and by the honourable tomb he swears, that stands upon your royal grandsire's bones, and by the royalties of both your bloods, currents that spring from one most gracious head, and by the buried hand of warlike gaunt, and by the worth and honour of himself, comprising all that may be sworn or said, his coming hither hath no further scope than for his lineal royalties, and to beg enfranchisement immediate on his knees, which on thy royal part he glanted once. His glittering arms he will commend to rust, his barred steeds to stables, and his heart to faithful service of your majesty. This swears he, as he is a prince, is just, and as I am a gentleman, I credit him. Northumberland say thus the king returns. His noble cousin is right welcome hither, and all the number of his fair demands shall be accomplished without contradiction. With all the gracious utterance thou hast, speak to his gentle hearing kind commends. We do debase ourselves, cousin, do we not, to look so poorly and to speak so fair? Shall we call back Northumberland and send defiance to the traitor and so die? No, my good lord. Let's fight with gentle words, till time lend friends, and friends lend their helpful swords. Oh God, oh God, that ere this tongue of mine that laid the sentence of dread banishment on yon proud man should take it off again with words of sooth, or that I were as great as is my grief, or lesser than my name, or that I could forget what I have been, or not remember what I must be now. Swelst thou, proud heart, I'll give thee scope to beat, since foes have scope to beat both thee and me. Northumberland comes back from Bolingbroke. What must the king do now? Must he submit? The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be contented. Must he lose the name of king? O oh, God's name, let it go. I give my jewels for a set of beads, my gorgeous palace for a hermitage, my gay apparel for an armsman's gown, my figured goblets for a dish of wood, my scepter for a palmer's walking staff, my subjects for a pair of carved saints, and my large kingdom for a little grave, a little... Little grave, an obscure grave, or I'll be buried in the king's highway, some way of common trade where subjects' feet may hourly trample on their sovereign's head, for on my heart they tread now whilst I live, and buried once, why not upon my head? O Merle, thou weepst, my tender-hearted cousin, 
We'll make foul weather with despised tears. Our sighs, and they shall lodge the summer corn, and make the dearth in this revolting land. Or shall we play the wantons with our woes, and make some pretty match with shedding tears, and thus to drop them still upon one place, till they have fretted us a pair of graves within this earth, and therein laid? There lies two kinsmen digged their graves with weeping eyes. Would not this ill do well? Well, well, I see I talk but idly, and you mock at me, most mighty prince, my lord Northumberland. What says King Bolingbroke? Will his majesty give Richard leave to live till Richard die? You make a leg, and Bolingbroke says I. My lord, in the base court he doth attend to speak with you. May it please you to come down. Down, down I come like glistering Phaethon, wandering the manage of unruly jades in the base court, base court where kings grow base to come at traitors' calls and do them grace. In the base court come down, down court, down king, for night owls shriek where mounting larks should sing. What think. says his majesty? <laughs> Sorrow and grief of heart makes him speak fondly, like a frantic man. Yet, he is come. Dun, 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 dun. And I come at downstage level now. I'm not on the, not on the battlements anymore. Stand all apart and show fair duty to his majesty, my gracious lord. Fair cousin, you debase your princely knee to make the base earth proud with kissing it. Me rather had my heart might feel your love than my unpleased eye see your courtesy. Up, cousin, up. Your heart is up, I know. Thus high, at least, although your knee be low. My gracious lord, I come but for mine own. Your own is yours, and I am yours, and all. So far be mine, my most redoubted lord, as true as my true service shall deserve your love. Well, you deserved. They, they well deserve to have, that know the strongest and surest way to get. Uncle, give me your hand. Nay, dry your eyes. Tears show their love, but want their remedies. Cousin, I am too young to be your father, though you are old enough to be my heir. What you will have I'll give, and willing too, for do we must what force will have us do. Set on towards London, cousin. Is it so? Yea, my good lord. Then I must not say no. And so we leave. Here comes the queen and two ladies. What sport shall we devise here in this garden to drive away the heavy thought of care? Madam, we'll play at the bowls. <laughs> Don't make me think the world is full of rubs and that my fortune rubs against the bias. Madam, we'll dance. My legs can keep no measure in delight, when my poor heart no measures keeps in griefs. Therefore, no dancing, girl, some other sport. Madam, we'll tell tales. Of sorrow? Of joy? Of either, madame. Of neither, girl. For of joy being altogether wanting, it doth remember me more of sorrow. Or if of grief being altogether had, it adds more sorrow to my want of joy. For what I have I need not to repeat, and what I want it boots not to complain. Madam, I'll sing. Tis well that thou hast cuz, but thou shouldst please me better. Wouldst thou weep? I could weep, madam. Would it do you good? And I could sing. Would weeping do me good, and never borrow any tear of thee? But stay, here come the gardeners. Uh, let's step into the shadow of these trees, my wretchedness unto a row of pins. They'll talk of state, for every one doth so. Against a change, woe is forerun with woe. Go, bind thou upon you dangling apricocks, which, like unruly children, make their sire stoop with oppression of the prodigal weight. Give some supportance to the bending twigs. Go thou, and like an executioner, cut off the heads of the two fast-growing sprays that took too lofty in our commonwealth. All must be even in our government, you thus employed. I will go root away the noisome weeds, which without profit suck the soil fertility from wholesome flowers. Why should we keep it in the compass of pale keep law and form in due proportion, showing as in a model our firm estate, when our sea-walled garden the whole land is full of weeds, her fairest flowers choke up. Her fruit trees all upturned, her hedges ruined, her knots disordered, and her wholesome herbs swarming with caterpillars. Hold thy peace. He hath, hath suffered this disordered spring, hath now himself met with 
fall of leaf. The weeds which his broad spreading leaves did shelter, that seemed in eating him up to do hold him away, are put up roots all about the boiling brook. I mean the Earl of Wiltshire, bushy, green. What, are they dead? They are, in boiling brook. Half seas the wasteful king. Oh, what a pity it is that he had not such trimmed and dressed his land as we discarded. We at time of year do wound the bark, the skin of fruit trees, less being overproud and sap and blood with too much riches it can find itself. Had he done so to great and growing men, they might have lived to bear and he to taste the fruits of duty. Superfluous branches we lop away, that bearing rolled me alive. Had he done so, himself had borne the crown, which waste of idle hours hath quite thrown down. What, do you think the king shall be disposed? Depressed he already is, and disposed his doubts he will be. Letters came last night to a dear friend of the good Duke of York's, that tell black tidings. Oh, I am pressed to death through want of speaking. Thou old Adam's likeness, set to dress this garden, how dare thy harsh rude tongue sound this unpleasant news? What Eve, what serpent hath suggested thee to make a second fall of cursed man? Why dost thou say King Richard is disposed? Darest thou, thou little better thing than earth, to vine his downfall? Say when, where, and how camest thou by these ill tidings? Speak, thou wretch! Pardon me, madame. Little joy I have to break this news, yet what I say is true. King Richard, he is in the mighty hold of Boilingbrook. His fortunes bold are weighed, and your lord's scale is nothing but himself and some few vanities that make him light. But in the bounds of great Boilingbrook, besides himself, are all the English peers, and with that odds he weighs King Richard down. Post you to London, and you will find it so. Speak no more than every one doth know. Nimble mischance, that art so light of foot, Do, doth not thy embassage belong to me? And am I the last that knows it? Oh, thou thinkst to serve me last, that I may longest keep thy sorrow in my breast. Come, ladies, go, to meet at London, London's king in woe. But I was born to this, that my sad look should grace the triumph of great Willingbroke, Gardener. For telling me these news of woe, pray God that the plants thou grafts may never grow. Poor queen, so that thy state might be no worse, I would my skill word subject to thy curse. Here did she fall a tear, here in this place shall set the bank of rue, sour herb of grace, rue even for wrath, even shortly shall be seen in the remembrance of a weeping queen. Dun, 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 dun. all right here come all the lads all the good lads and all the bad lads they're going into parliament they're going to hash it out they're going to sort it out um it's everybody it's the whole team villains and heroes let's go <laughs> i think it's bolingbrook first I've been muted for the last few lines. Sorry. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Call forth Baggett. Now, Baggett, freely speak thy mind. What thou dost know of noble Gloucester's death, who wrought it with the king, and who performed the bloody office of his timeless end? Then set before my face the Lord Omriel. Cousin, stand forth and look upon that man. My Lord Omriel, I know your daring tongue scores to unsay what once hath delivered... In that dead times when Gloucester's death was plotted, I heard you say, It's not my arm of length that reacheth from the fall of restful English court and follows callous to mine uncle's head? Amongst much other times talk, that very time I heard you say that you had rather refused the offer of a hundred thousand crowns than Bolingbroke's return to England, adding withal how blessed this land would be in your cousin's death. Princes and noble lords, what answer shall I make to this base man? Shall I so much dishonour my fair stars on equal terms to give him chastisement? Either I must, or have mine honour soiled with the attainder of his slanderous lips. There is my gauge, the manual seal of death that marks thee out for hell. I say, thou liest. 
and will maintain what thou hast said is false in thy heart blood, though being all too base to stain the temper of my knightly sword. Beg it forbear, thou shalt not take it up. Excepting one, I would he were the best, in all this presence that hath moved me so. And I'm also Fitzwater. I should explain to the audience that they're arguing over who murdered the Duke of Gloucester ages ago, um, and everyone knows that it was actually King Richard that ordered that, and all the audience at the time would know that it's King Richard ordered the death of the Duke of Gloucester, but you can't say that out loud because you can't accuse the king of murder, so everyone's kind of like trying to find a way of accusing him of doing it without doing it. But anyway, I'm also Fitzwater, and everyone's challenging everyone to a duel, and I say, if that thy valour stand on sympathy, there is my gauge, O Merle, engaged to thine, by that fair sum that shows me where thou standst. I heard thee say, and vauntingly thou spakest it, that thou wert cause of noble Gloucester's death. If thou deniest it twenty times, thou liest, and I will turn thy falsehood to thy heart where it was forged with my rapier's point. Thou darest not, coward, live to see that day. Now by my soul, I would it were this hour. Fitzwater, thou art damned to hell for this. O Merle, thou liest, his honour is as true in this apparel as thou art all unjust, and that thou art, there I throw my gauge to prove it on thee to the extremest point of mortal breathing. Seize it if thou darest. And if I do not, may my hands rot off and never brandish more revengeful steel over the glittering helmet of my foe. Who's sorry? I'll be sorry as well. My lord Fitzwaters, I do remember well the very time, O Merle, and you did talk. My lord, tis very true, you were in presence then, and you can witness to me this is true, as false by heaven as heaven itself is true. Sorry, thou liest, dishonourable boy, that lie shall lie so heavy on my sword that it shall render vengeance and revenge, till thou the lie giver, and that lie do lie in earth as quiet as thy father's skull. In proof whereof there is mine honour's pawn, engage it to the trial if thou darest. How fondly dost thou spur a forward horse, if I dare eat or drink or breathe or live, I dare meet Surrey in a wilderness and spit upon him whilst I say he lies and lies and lies there is my bond of faith to thee strong my strong correction I'm gonna need more gloves and I intend to thrive in this new world O Merle is guilty of my true appeal besides I heard the banished Norfolk say that thou O Merle did send two of thy men to execute the noble Duke of Calais who sets me else by heaven I'll throw it all I have a thousand spirits in one breast to answer twenty thousand such as you Oh, that's, that's a different line. Okay, I couldn't find where I was. I, th- I didn't know if your script was different to mine. Oh, no. I think in, in mine, O'Mill borrows somebody else's glove and throws it down. <laughs> so, <they put laughs> no, we, uh, so uh, our copy has, instead of um, instead of that big, long uh, uh, monologue, it's just a random lord who's like, whoa, hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, have you got Bolingbroke, these differences shall all rest? Uh, yes, okay, we'll get up to there. These differences shall all rest under gauge, till Norfolk be repealed, repealed he shall be. And though mine enemy restored again to all his lands and signories, when he was returned against Almerle will enforce his trial. That honourable day shall ne'er be seen. Many a time hath banished Norfolk fought for Jesu Christ in glorious Christian field, streaming the ensign of the Christian cross against black pagans, Turks and Saracens, and toiled with works of war, retired himself to Italy, and there at Venice gave his body to that pleasant country's earth, and his pure soul unto his captain Christ, under whose colours he had fought so long. Why, Bishop, is Norfolk dead? As sure as I live, my lord. Sweet peace conduct his sweet soul to the bosom of good old Abraham. Lord's appellants, your differences shall all rest under gauge till we assign you to your days of trial. F's in the chat for Thomas Mowbray, who you'll all remember from Act 1. But end co- uh, here comes the Duke of York. Great Duke of Lancaster, I come to thee from plume-plucked Richard, who with willing soul adopts the heir, and his high scepter yields to the possession of thy royal hand. Ascend his throne, descending now from him, and long live Henry, of that name the fourth. In God's name, I'll ascend the regal throne. Marry heaven forbid! Worst in this royal presence may I speak, yet best beseeming me to speak the truth. Would God that any in this noble presence were enough noble to be upright judge of noble Richard? Then true noblest would learn him forbearance from so foul a wrong. What subjects can give sentence on his king? And who sits here that is not Richard's subject? Thieves are not judged, but by they are... By they... 
Thieves are not judged, but they are by to hear, although apparent guilt be seen in them, and shall the figure of God's majesty, his captain, steward, deputy elect, anointed, crowned, planted many years, be judged by subject and inferior breath, and he himself not present? Oh, forbid it, God, that in a Christian climate souls refined should show so hideous, black, obscene a deed. I speak to subjects, and a subject speaks, stirred up by heaven, thus bodily for his king. My lord of Hereford here, whom you call king, is a foul traitor to proud Hereford's king. And if you crown him, let me prophesy. The blood of English man, of English, shall manure the ground, and future ages groan for his foul act. Peace shall go sleep with Turks and infidels, and in this seat of peace tumultuous wars shall kin with kin and kind with kind confound. Disorder, horror, fear and mutiny shall here inhabit, and this land be called the field of Golgotha and dead men's skulls. Oh, if you rear this house against this house, it will the woefulest division prove that ever fell upon this cursed earth. Prevent it, resist it, and let it not be so, lest child, child's children cry against you woe well have you argued sir and for your pains of capital treason we arrest you here my lord of westminster be it your charge to keep him safely till his day of trial may it please you lords to grant the common suit fetch hither richard that in common view he may surrender so we shall proceed without suspicion i will be his conduct Lords, you that here are under arrest, procure your searches for your days of answer. Little are we beholding to your love, and little looked for your helping hands. In comes Richard. Alack, why am I sent for to a king before I have shook off the regal thoughts wherewith I reigned? I hardly yet have learned to insinuate, flatter, bow, and bend my knee, give sorrow leave a while to tutor me to this submission. Yet I well remember the favours of these men, were they not mine? Did they not sometime cry, All hail to me? So Judas did to Christ, but he in twelve found truth in all but one, I in twelve thousand none. God save the king. Will no man say Amen? Am I both priest and clerk? Well then, Amen. God save the king, although I be not he, and yet Amen if heavens do think in me. To do what service am I sent for hither? To do that office of thine own good will, which tired majesty did make thee offer, the resignation of thy state and crown, to Henry Bolingbroke. Give me the crown. Here, cousin. Seize the crown. Here, cousin, on this side my hand, on that side thine. Now is this golden crown like a deep well, that owes two buckets filling one another, the empty are ever dancing in the air, the other down, unseen and full of water. That bucket down and full of tears am I, drinking my griefs whilst you mount up on high. I thought you had been willing to resign. My crown I am, but still my griefs are mine. You may my glories and my state depose, but not my griefs. Still am I king of those. Part of your cares you give me with your crown. Your cares set up do not pluck my cares down. My care is loss of care, by old care done. Your care is gain of care, by new care won. The cares I give I have, though given away. They tend the crown, yet still with me they stay. Are you contented to resign the crown? I, no. No, I. For I must nothing be. Therefore, no, no, for I resign to thee. Now mark me how I will undo myself. I give this heavy weight from off my head, and this unwieldy scepter from my hand. The pride of kingly sway from out my heart. With mine own tears I wash away my balm. With mine own hands I give away my crown. With mine own tongue deny my sacred state. With mine own breath release all duteous oaths. All pomp and majesty I do forswear. My manners, rents, revenues I forego. My acts, decrees and statutes I deny. God pardon all oaths that are broke to me. God keep all vows unbroke are made to thee. Make me that nothing have with nothing grieved. And thou with all pleased that hast all achieved. Long mayest thou live in Richard's seat to sit, And soon lie Richard in an earthly pit. God save King Henry, unkinged Richard, says, And sent him many years of sunshine days. What more remains? No more. But that you read 
these accusations and these grievous crimes committed by your person and your followers against the state and prophet of this land, that by confessing them, the souls of men may deem that you are worthily deposed. Must I do so? And must I ravel out my weaved-up follies, gentle Northumberland, if thy offences were upon record, we did not shame thee in so fair a troop to read a lecture of them? If thou wouldst, there shouldst thou find one heinous article containing the deposing of a king, and cracking the strong warrant of an oath, marked with a blot damned in the book of heaven. Nay, all of you that stand and look upon me, whilst that my wretchedness doth bait myself, though some of you with pilot wash your hands, showing an outward pity, yet you pilots have here delivered me to my sour cross, and water cannot wash away your sin. My lord, dispatch, read over these articles. Mine eyes are full of tears, I cannot see. And yet salt water blinds them not so much, but they can see a sort of traitors here. Nay, if I turn mine eyes upon myself, I find a traitor. I find myself a traitor with the rest, for I have given here my soul's consent to undeck the pompous body of a king, made glory base and sovereignty a slave, proud majesty a subject, state a peasant. My lord! No lord of thine, thou haught insulting man, no no man's lord. I have no name, no title. No, not that name was given me at the font, but tis usurped. Alack that heavy day that I have worn so many winters out, and know not how what name to call myself. Oh, that I were a mockery king of snow, standing before the sun of Bolingbroke to melt myself away in water drops. Good king, great king, and yet not so greatly good. And if my word be sterling yet in England, let it command a mirror hither straight, that it may show me what face I have, since it is bankrupt of his majesty. Go some of you and fetch a looking glass. Read over this paper while the glass doth come. Fiend, thou torments me ere I come to hell. Urge it no more, my lord Northumberland. The commons will not then be satisfied. They shall be satisfied. I'll read enough when I do see the very book indeed where all my sins are writ, and that's myself. Give me that glass, and therein will I read. No deeper wrinkles yet? Hath sorrow struck so many blows upon this face of mine, and made no deeper wounds? A flattering glass, like to my followers in prosperity, thou dost beguile me. Was this face the face that every day under his household roof did keep ten thousand men? Was this the face that, like the sun, did make beholders wink? Is this the face which faced so many follies that was at last outfaced by Bolingbroke? A brittle glory shineth in this face, as brittle as the glory is the face. <laughs> For there it is, cracked in an hundred shivers. Mark silent, king, the moral of this sport. How soon my sorrow hath destroyed my face. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face. Say that again, the shadow of my sorrow? Huh, let's see. It is very true, my grief lies all within, and these external manner of laments are merely shadows to the unseen grief that swells with silence in the tortured soul. There lies the substance, and I thank thee, King, for thy great bounty that not only gives me cause to wail, but teaches me the way how to lament the cause. I'll beg one boon, and then be gone and trouble you no more. Shall I obtain it? Name it, fair cousin. Fair cousin, I am greater than a king, for when I was a king, my flatterers were then but subjects. Being now a subject, I have a king here to my flatterer. Being so great, I have no need to beg. Yet ask. And shall I have? You shall. Then give me leave to go. Whither? Whither you will, so I were from your sights. Go, some of you convey him to the tower. Oh, good. Convey. Conveyors are you all that rise thus nimbly by a true king's fall. And I get led away under arrest. <laughs> On Wednesday next, we solemnly set down our coronation. Lords, prepare yourselves. Everybody leaves except Carlisle, the abbot, and O'Mill. Woeful pageants have we here beheld. The woes to come, the children yet unborn, shall feel this day so sharp to them as thorn. You, holy clergyman, is there no plot to rid the realm of this pernicious blot? My lord, before I freely speak my mind herein, you shall not only take the sacrament to bury mine intents, but also to effect, effect what I shall happen to devise. I see your brows are full of discontents, your hearts of sorrows, and your eyes of tears. Come home with me to supper, and I'll lay a plot shall show us all a merry day. 
And so they go. And here in Act 5 come the Queen and the ladies. I'm going to draw the curtains because the sun's coming in here. I'll be back in two minutes. Keep going. This way the king will come. This is the way to Julius Caesar's ill-erected tower, to whose flint bosom my condemned lord is doomed a prisoner by the proud boiling broke. Here, let us rest. If this rebellious earth have any resting for her true king's queen... That's thought. But see, or rather, do not see my fair rose weather. Yet look up. Behold, that you in pity may dissolve to the dew and wash him fresh again with true love's tears. <laughs> Thou, the model where old Troy did stand, thou map of honor, thou King Richard's tomb, and not King Richard, thou most beauteous inn. Why should a hard favored grief be lodged in thee, when triumph of this become an alehouse? Join not with grief, fair woman, do not so, to make my end too sudden. Learn, good soul, to think our former state a happy dream, from which await the truth of what we are, show us but this. I am sworn brother sweet to grim necessity, and he and I will keep a league till death. Hie thee to France and cloister thee in some religious house. Our holy lives must win a new world's crown, which our profane hours here have stricken down. What? Is my Richard both in shape and mind transformed and weakened? Hath boiling broke deposed thine intellect? Hath he been in thy heart? The lion dying trusteth forth his paw and wounds the earth, if nothing else. With rage to be overpowered, and wilt thou pupil like, take thy correction mildly, kiss the rod, and fawn on rage with base humility, which art a lion and king of beasts. A king of beasts indeed, if aught but beasts I had been still a happy king of men. Good sometime queen, prepare thee hence for France, think I am dead, and that even here thou takest, as from my deathbed, thy last living leave. In winter's tedious nights sit by the fire with good old folks, and let them tell thee tales of woeful ages long ago betid. And ere thou bid good night to quit their grief, tell thou the lamentable fall of me, and send the hearers weeping to their beds. For why the senseless brands will sympathise the heavy accent of thy moving tongue, and in compassion weep the fire out, and some will mourn in ashes, some coal black for the deposing of a rightful king. My lord, the mind of Bolingbroke is changed. You must to Pomfret, not unto the tower. And, madam, there is all attained for you. With all swift speed you must away to France. Northumberland, thou ladder wherewithal the mounting Bolingbroke ascends my throne, the time shall not be many hours of age more than it is ere, more than it is ere foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. Thou shalt think, though he divide the realm and give thee half, it is too little, helping him to all. He shall think that thou, which knowest the way to plant unrightful kings, will know again, being ne'er so little urged another way to pluck him headlong from the usurped throne. The love of wicked friends converts to fear, that fear to hate, and hate turns one or both to worthy danger and deserved death. My guilt be on my head, and there an end. Take leave and part, for you must part forthwith. Doubly divorced. Bad men, ye violate a twofold marriage, twixt my crown and me, and then betwixt me and my married wife. Let me unkiss the oath twixt thee and me, and yet not so, for with a kiss twas made. Part us, Northumberland, I towards the north, where shivering cold and sickness pines the clime, my queen to France, from whence set forth in pomp she came adorned hither like sweet May, sent back like Hallamus or shorts of day. And must we be divided? Must we part? Aye. Hand from hand, my love, and heart from heart. Banish us both, and send the king with me. That were some love, but little policy. And whether he goes, thither I let me go. So two, together weeping, make one woe. Weep thou for me in France, I for thee here. Better far off than near, be ne'er the near. Go count thy way with sighs, I mine with groans. So longest way shall have the longest moans. Twice for one step are grown, the way being short, and peace the way out with a heavy heart. Come, come, in wooing sorrow let's be brief, since wedding it there is such length in grief. Mwah. One kiss shall stop our mouths and dumbly part, thus give I mine, and thus I take thy heart. Give me mine own again, t'were no good part to take on me to keep and kill thy heart, so now I have mine own again. Be gone, and I might strive to kill it with a groan. We make woe wanton with this fond delay. 
one more adieu. The rest let sorrow say. So there they go. And in comes the Duke of York, who is also me, and his Duchess. <laughs> My lord, you told me you would tell the rest when weeping made you break the story off of our two cousins coming into London. Where did I leave? At that sad stop, my lord, where rude misgoverned hands from windows tops threw dust and rubbish off on King Richard's head. Then, as I said, the Duke, great Bolingbroke, mounted upon a hot and fiery steed, which his aspiring rider seemed to know, with slow but stately pace kept on his course, while all tongues cried, God save thee, Bolingbroke. You would have thought the very windows spake, so many greedy looks of young and old through casements darted their desiring eyes upon his visage, and that all the walls with painted imagery had said at once, Jesu preserve thee, welcome, Bolingbroke, whilst he from one side to the other turning, bareheaded, lower than his proud steed's neck, bespake them thus, I thank you, countryman, and thus still doing thus he passed along. Alack, poor Richard, where rode he the whilst? As in a theatre, the eyes of men after a well-graced actor leaves the stage, are idly bent upon him that enters next, thinking his prattle to be tedious. Even so, with so much more contempt, men's eyes did scowl on Richard. No man cried God save him, no joyful tongue gave him his welcome home, but dust was thrown upon his sacred head, which with such gentle sorrow he shook off his face, still combating with tears and smiles, the badges of his grief and patience, that had not God for some strong purpose steeled the hearts of men, they must perforce have melted, and barbarism itself have pitied him. But heaven hath a hand in these events, to whose high will we bound our calm content. To Bolingbroke are we sworn subjects now, who state and honour eye for eye allow. Here comes my son, Amel. Our mill that was, but that is lost for being Richard's friend. And, madam, you must call him Rutland now. I am in Parliament pledged for his truth and lasting fealty to the new-made king. Welcome, my son. Who are the violets now that strew the green lap of the new-come spring? Madam, I know not, nor I greatly care not. God knows I had as leaf be one as one. Well, bear you well in this new spring of time, lest you be cropped before you come to prime. What news from Oxford? Hold those jousts and triumphs. <laughs> For as I know, my lord, they do. Ah, you will be there, I know. If God prevent not, I purpose so. What seal is that that hangs without thy bosom? Yea, looks thou pale. Let me see the writing. My lord, tis nothing. No matter then who sees it, I will be satisfied. Let me see the writing. I do beseech your grace to pardon me. It is a matter of small consequence, which for some reasons I would not have seen. Which for some reasons, sir, I mean to see. I fear... I fear... What should you fear? This is nothing but some bond that he's entered into for gay apparel against the triumph day. Bound to himself, what doth he with a bond that he is bound to? Wife, thou art a fool. Boy, let me see the writing. I do beseech you. Pardon me. I, I may not show it. I will be satisfied. Let me see it, I say. Snatches the letter from him and reads it. Treason, foul treason, villain, traitor, slave. What is the matter, my lord? Oh, who's within there? Saddle my horse, heaven for his mercy, what treachery is here? Why, what is it, my lord? Give me my boots, I say, saddle my horse. Now by my honour, my life, my troth, I will impeach the villain. What is the matter? Peace, foolish woman. I will not peace, what is the matter, Amaril? Good mother, be content. It's, it is no more than my poor life must answer. Thy life answer. Bring me my boots, I will unto the king. Strike him, Amarill. Poor boy, thou art amazed. Hence, villain, never more come in my sight. Give me my boots, I say. Why, York, what wilt thou do? What wilt thou not hide the trespasses of thine own? Have we more sons, or are we like to have? Is not my teeming date drunk up with the time? And wilt thou pluck my fair son from mine age, and rob me of a happy mother's name? Is he not like thee? Is he not thine own? Thou fond mad woman, wilt thou conceal this dark conspiracy? A dozen of them have here taken the sacrament, and interchangeably set down their hands to kill the king at Oxford. He shall be none. We'll keep him here. Then what is that to him? Away, foul woman, were he twenty times my son, I would approach him. A peach him. Hadst, hadst thou groaned for him, as I would have done, thou wouldst have been more pitiful. But now I know thy mind, 
thou dost suspect that I have been disloyal to thy bed? And that he is a bastard, not thy son? Sweet York, sweet husband, be not of that mind. He is as like thee as a man may be, not like to me or any of my kin, and yet I love him. Make way, unruly woman, and so I leave, to stop this foul plot. After Amorel, mount thee upon his horse, spur post, and get before him to the king, and beg thy pardon ere he do accuse thee. I'll not be long behind, though I be old, I doubt, but not to ride as fast as York. And never will I rise up from the ground till Boiling Broke has pardoned thee. Away! Be gone! Everyone runs off, but it's Act 5, Scene 3, and here comes Boiling Brook, Percy, and all the other lads. Can no man tell me of my unthrifty son? Tis full three months since I did see him last. If any plague hang over us, tis he. I would to God, my lords, he might be found. Inquire at London, amongst the taverns there, for there they say he doth daily, he daily doth frequent with unrestrained, loose companions, even such, they say, as stand in narrow lanes and beat our watch and rob our passengers, which he, young, wanton, and effeminate boy, takes on the point of honors to support so dissolute a crew. My lord, some two days... Oh, that's the wrong word. My lord, some two days since I saw the prince and told him of these triumphs held at Oxford. And what said the gallant? Uh, his answer was he would unto the stews and from the commonest creature pluck a glove and wear it as a favor, and with that he would unhorse the lustiest challenger. As dissolute as desperate, yet through both I see some sparks of better hope which elder years may happily bring forth. But who comes here? Where is the king? What means our cousin that he stares and looks so wildly? God save your grace, I do beseech your majesty to have some conference with your grace alone. Withdraw yourselves and leave us here. What is the matter with our... What is the matter with our cousin now? Forever may my knees grow to the earth, my tongue cleave to my ruth within my mouth, unless a pardon ere I rise or speak. Intended or committed was this fault? If on the first, how heinous ere it be, to win thy, lo thy after love I pardon. Then give me leave that I may turn the key, that no man enter till my tale be done. Have thy desire. My liege, beware, look to thyself, thou hast a traitor in thy presence there. Villain, I'll make thee safe. Schwing! Stay thy revengeful hand, thou hast no cause to fear. Open the door, secure foolhardy king. Shall I for love speak treason to thy face? Open the door, or I will break it open. Poof, enter What's the, the matter, uncle? Speak. Recover breath. Tell us how near is danger that we may arm us in, uh, to encounter it. Peruse this writing here, and thou shalt know the reason that my haste forbids me show. Remember, as thou reads, thy promises past, I do repent me. Read not my name there, my heart is not confederate with my hand. It was, villain, ere thy hand did set it down. I tore it from the traitor's bosom, king. Fear and not love begets his penitence. Forget to pity him, lest thy pity prove a serpent that will sting thee to thy heart. O heinous, strong and bold conspiracy, O loyal father of a treacherous son, thou sheer immaculate and silver fountain from whence this, where this stream, though, my, though muddy passages, hath held his current and defiled himself, thy overflow of good converts to bad, and thy abundant goodness shall excuse this deadly blot in thy disgressing son. So shall my virtue be as vice's board, and he shall spend mine honour with his shame, as thriftless sons their scraping father's gold. Mine honour lives when his dishonour dies, or my shamed life in his dishonour lies. Thou kill'st me in his life, giving him breath. The traitor lives, the truest man's put to death. What ho, my liege! For God's sake, let me in! What shill voice supplicant makes this eager cry? A woman, and thy aunt, great king. Tis I. Speak with me, pity me. Open the door, a beggar begs that never begged before. Our scene is altered from a serious thing, and now changed to the beggar and the king. My dangerous cousin, let your mother in. I know she has come to pray for your foul sin. If thou do pardon whatsoever pray, more sins for this forgiveness prosper may. This fested joint cut off, the rest set, the rest rest sound. This let alone will all the rest confound. O king, believe not this hard-hearted man. Love loving not itself, none other can. Thou frantic woman, what dost thou make here? Shall thy old dogs once more a traitor here? Knit rear. Sweet York, be patient. Hear me, gentle liege. Rise up, good aunt. Not yet, I thee beseech. Forever I will walk upon my knees, and never see day that the happy sees, till thou give joy, until thou bid me joy, by pardoning Rutland, my transgressing boy. 
Unto my mother's prayers I bend my knee. Against them both my true joints bended be. Everyone's kneeling down and begging for to, to do contradictory things. <laughs> Pleads he in earnest, look upon his face. His eyes do drop no tears. His prayers are in jest. His words come from his mouth, ours from our breast. He prays but faintly and would be denied. We pray with heart and soul all beside. His weary joints would gladly rise. I know our knees shall kneel till the ground they grow. His prayers are full of false hypocrisy. Hours of true zeal and deep integrity. Our prayers do outpray hits, and then let them have that mercy which true prayer ought to have. Good aunt, stand up. Nay, do not say stand up. Say pardon first, and afterwards stand up. And if I were thy nurse, thy tongue to teach, pardon would be the first word of thy speech. I never longed to hear a word till now. Say pardon, king, let pity teach thee how. The word is short, but not so short as sweet. No word like pardon for king's mouth so meet. Speak it in French, king, say pardonnez-moi. Dost thou teach pardon, pardon to destroy? Ah, my sour husband, my hard-hearted lord, that sets the world itself against the word. Speak pardon as tis current in our land, the chopping French we do not understand. Thine eyes begins to speak, that set thy tongue there, or in thy piteous heart plant thou thine ear, that hearing how our plants and prayers do pierce, pity may move thee pardon to rehearse. Good aunt. Stand up. I do not sue to stand. Pardon is all the suit I have in hand. I pardon him as God shall pardon me. Oh, happy vantage of a kneeling knee. Yet I am sick for fear. Speak it again. Twice saying pardon doth not pardon twain, but makes one pardon strong. Just in case Chad is super lost, Henry was the first king who actually spoke english as a first language like all like the like eight previous to this were all actually french Ooh. so that that's why that's what this conversation is about uh-huh. is that's all that that's this back and forth about don't say it in don't say it in 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 french and but the nobles are like say it in french and make it real and and the lower people are like, no just, just do it in english yeah that's if, if you're lost, that's why oh, that's what's that. been going on for the last couple minutes. Uh, with all my heart, I pardon him. Oh, God on earth thou art. But for our trusty brother-in-law and the abbot, with all the rest of that consorted crew, destruction straight shall dog them at the heels. Good uncle, help to order several powers to Oxford or wherever these traitors are. They shall not live within this world, I swear but I will have them if I once know where. Uncle, farewell, and cousin, to adieu. Your mother well hath prayed and proved you true. Come, my old son. I pray God make thee new. And everyone leaves. And in comes Exton and the servants. Didst thou not mark the king? What words he speak? Have I no friend will rid me of this living fear? Was it not so? These were his very words. Have I no friend, quoth he? He spake it twice, and urged it twice together, did he not? He did. And speaking it, he wistly looked on me. And who should say, I would thou wert the man that would divorce this terror from my heart, meaning the king at Pomfrey. Come, let's go. I am the king's friend, and will rid his foe. And here comes Richard for his final scene. Prepare the the F keys. I have been studying how to compare this prison where I live unto the world, and for because the world is populous, and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Yet I'll hammer it out. My brain I'll prove the female to my soul, my soul the father, and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts, and these same thoughts people this little world, in humours like the people of this world, for no thought is contented. The better sort, as thoughts of things divine are intermixed with scruples and do set the faith itself against the faith, as thus come little ones, and then again. It is as hard to come as for a camel to thread the posts of a needle's eye. Thoughts tending to ambition, they do plot unlikely wonders. How these vain, weak nails may tear a passage through the flinty ribs of this hard world, my ragged prison walls. And for they cannot die in their own pride. 
Faults tending to content flatter themselves that they are not the first of fortune's slaves, nor shall not be the last, like silly beggars who, sitting in the stocks, refuse their shame. But many have, and others must sit there, and in this thought they find a kind of ease, bearing their own misfortune on the back of such as have before endured the like. Thus play I in one prison many people, and none contented. Sometimes I'm the king. Then treason makes me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king, that, am I, that I am I kinged again, and by and by think I that I am unkinged by Bolingbroke and straight and nothing. But whate'er I am, music starts playing, nor I nor any man that is this, with nothing shall be pleased till he be eased with being nothing. Music do I hear? Oh, keep time. How sour sweet music is when time is broke and no proportion kept. So is it in the music of men's lives, and he have I the daintiness of ear to hear time broke in undisordered string. But for the concord of my state and time, had not an ear to hear my true time broke, I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. For now hath time made me his numbering clock. My thoughts are minutes, and with sights they jar their watches on unto mine eyes the outward watch where to my finger like a dial's point is pointing still and cleansing them from tears. Now, sir, the sound that tells what hour it is are clamorous groans that strike upon my heart, which is the bell. So sighs and tears and groans show minutes, hours and times, but my time runs posting on in Bolingbroke's proud joy while I stand fooling here his jack of the clock. This music mads me. Let it sound no more. Music stops. For though it have holp madmen to their wits in me, it seems it will make wise men mad. Yet blessing on his heart that gives it me, for tis a sign of love, and love to Richard is a strange brooch in this all-hating world. Enter a groom. Hail, royal prince! Thanks, noble peer. The cheapest of us is ten groats too dear. What art thou, and how comest thou hither when no man ever comes but that sad dog that brings me food to make misfortune live? Oh, I was a poor groom of thy stable, king. When thou wert king, who, travelling towards York, with much ado at length hath gotten leave to look upon my sometimes royal master's face, oh, how it yearned my heart when I beheld in London streets that coronation day, when boiling broke road on Rowan Barbary, that horse that thou so often I have bestrid, that horse that I so carefully addressed. Rode he on Barbary? Tell me, gentle friend, how went he under him? So proudly as if he disdained the ground. So proud that Bolingbroke was on his back, that Jade hath eat bread from my royal hand. This hand hath made him proud with clapping him. Would not he stumble? Would not he fall down, since pride must have a fall and break the neck of that proud man that did usurp his back? Forgiveness, horse, why do I rail on thee, since thou, created to be awed by man, wast born to bear? I was not made a horse. And yet I bear a burden like an ass, spurred, galled, and tired by jauncing Bolingbroke. Here comes a keeper Fellow. with a dish. I guess like a jail, like a jailer. Yeah. Fellow, give peace. Here is no longer stay. If thou love me, tis time thou wert away. And the groom leaves. Wet my tongue. No, dares not that heart. Oh, sorry. What my tongue dares not that my heart shall say. My lord, wilt please you the failed to? Fault? Taste of it first, as thou were wont to do. My lord, I dare not. Sir Pierce of Exton, who lately came from the king, commands the... The devil take Henry of Lancaster and thee. Patience is stale, and I am weary of it. Help, Swing! Help, In come help. a bunch of dudes with swords. How now, what means death in this rude assault? Villain, thine own hands yield thy death's instruments. And I, I take a weapon from somebody, and I kill them with it. Ha ha! Pff, and then I kill somebody else. Ha ha! But then Exton kills me. That hand shall burn in never quenching fire that staggers thus my person, Exton. Thy fierce hand hath with the king's blood stained the king's own hand. Mount, mount, my soul, thy seat is up on high, whilst my gross flesh sinks downward, here to die. As full of valour as of royal blood, both have I spilled, or would the deed were good. For now the devil, that told me I did well, says that this deed is chronicled in hell. This dead king to the living king I'll bear, 
Take hence the rest, and give him burial here. Dur, 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 dur. Here comes Bollybrook, the Duke of York, and all the other lads who aren't dead. Kind Uncle York, the latest news we hear is that the rebels have consumed with fire our town of Sister in Gloucestershire, but whither they be taken or slain we hear not. Here comes the Earl of Northumberland. Welcome, my lord, what is the news? First, to thy sacred state, wish I all happiness. The next news is, I have to London sent the heads of Oxford, Salisbury, Blunt, and Kent. The manner of their taking may appear at large discourse in this paper here. We thank thee, gentle Percy, for thy pains, and to thy worth will add right worthy gains. Here comes Fitzwaters, who's me. My lord, I have from Oxford sent to London the heads of Brocus and Sir Bennet Seeley, two of the dangerous consorted traitors that sought at Oxford thy dire overthrow. Thy pains, Fitzwater, shall not be forgot. Right noble is thy merit, will I wot. Enter the Percy and Carlyle, both of whom are me. The grand conspirator, abbot of Westminster, with clog of conscience and sour melancholy, hath yielded up his body to the grave. But here is Carlyle living to abide thy kingly doom and sentence of his pride. Carlyle, this is your doom. Choose out some secret place, some reverend room, more than thou hast, and with it joy thy life. So, as thou livest in peace, die free from strife. For, though mine enemy thou hast ever been, high sparks of honor in thee I have seen. In comes Exton carrying a coffin. Great king, within this coffin I present thy buried fear. Herein, all breathless, lies the mightiest of thy greatest enemies, Richard of Bordeaux, by me hither brought. Exton. I thank thee not, for thou hast wrought a deed of slander with thy fatal hand upon my head and all this famous land. From your own mouth, my lord, did I this deed. They love not poison that do poison need, nor do I thee. Though I did wish him dead, I hate the murderer, love him murdered. The guilt of conscience take thou for thy labor, but neither my good, good word nor princely favor. With Cain go wander through shades of night and never show thy head by day light. Lords, I protest, my soul is full of woe that blood should sprinkle me to make me grow. Come, mourn with me for that I do lament and put on sullen black in content. I'll make a voyage to the Holy Land to wash blood off from my guilty hand march sadly after grace my mourning here in weeping after this untimely beer oh and that's the end that Woo! is the end of richard the hey. second oh all righty then oh. <laughs> kind of got that play's got a fat ass it drags at the end yeah, yeah. bit of a beast <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit of a my, piece. Uh, I, I really love um, the the extended scene in the garden <laughs> with the ladies <laughs> and the queen and the gardener that is just so transparently padding so that Henry and Richard can have a break and change costumes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I should have picked an abridged version, but nope, we went with the RSC one. Um, okay, um, <laughs> we have raised. We, we've been streaming now for almost eleven and a half hours. Um, we've raised thirty-one thousand six hundred and thirty-two dollars and twenty-seven p, which is um, almost to the weed number. <laughs> to the meme, to the meme number. Um, uh, Alice is still asleep in the next room, I think. So I'll probably uh, we'll go to intermission. I'll probably go and wake her up, but then I'll probably sleep. And we'll make a plan before I go to sleep uh, about what will happen whilst I'm out. Because I, yeah, I think I've got to go rest. But um, I'll be back in a minute to explain whatever the plan is. But uh, for now, thank you very much to everybody uh, for for tuning in, and we'll be back later with something. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you for having us on to read. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.